Hello everyone and welcome to my limited set review for Streets of New Capenna. As usual you can find all my limited tier lists if you're a Twitch subscriber or Patreon on my private Discord server where I'll try and keep all these spreadsheets up to date with all these ratings so you get a quick reference guide and I'm sure some of these ratings in our review today will change over time. First off I want to explain my rating system. So I try and use a letter grade system, taking some cards from the previous expansion, an example of an S tier level card, which is the highest grade a card can get, is reserved for ridiculous bombs. These are cards that can individually take over a game and are very difficult for the opponent to recover from. So the Wandering Emperor, a perfect example. In the A tier, we still have absolute bomb level cards, cards you're ecstatic to first pick. And if unanswered, these cards will also run away with the game, but not necessarily as unanswerable as some of the S tier level cards. Tatsunari, an example, a Reckoner Bankbuster providing a ton of card advantage, I would also classify as an A tier level card. Then in the B tier, we've got some of the best commons in each color might fall in the B grade. We've got powerful unconditional removal usually falls in that category as well, Assassin's Inc. being an example. We've got nice 2 for one style creatures, cards like Blossom Prancer from Kamigawa. Then we get to the C plus tier. These are still definitely above average cards, cards you're happy to include in pretty much any deck that's playing those colors. Uh, removal that's maybe a little bit more conditional in nature or maybe a little bit more expensive than you would like uh, could fall in this category as well. Time use completion, I would say, a C plus level card. And a card like Iron Hoof Boar, which is pretty flexible, can use it as a combo trick or a creature, definitely makes it better than your traditional combo trick. I would fit into the C plus category, cards you're almost never gonna cut if you're playing these respective colors. Then we get to the C tier, which is the main bulk of the cards in the set. Cards like Wanderer's Intervention, that's not only conditional, needs to target an attacking or blocking creature, but also only deals four damage, so won't be able to answer the larger creatures. So that's an example of a C tier level card. Season of Renewal, a card you're pretty happy to have one copy of, but also goes down in value pretty quickly. So not a card I would want a ton of copies of, so you don't need to prioritize it during the draft. Is also an example of a C tier level card. Then we get to the D tier. These are cards that are going to get cut from your deck more often than not. Doesn't mean you'll never play them. Cards like Spell Pierce, which is just conditional in nature and not incredibly powerful, even if it does potentially a lineup, is an example of a bad filler D tier card. A card like Light the Way, a comma trick that's not incredibly impactful. A lot of comma tricks might get a C grade, but some of the weaker ones can slip into the D tier instead. And then finally, the F grade is reserved for the absolute worst cards in the set. And there's not many of them in Limited these days. They're often weird sideboard cards for Constructed. Uh, March of uh, Burgeoning Life here. Probably one of the worst cards I've seen in recent memory definitely deserving of an F. So that's my rating system. First off we'll do a quick overview of the archetypes and I've broken them up in the five families of Streets of New Capenna, starting at the top with the brokers which is green, white and blue. This is a color pair that cares about protection and control and it's kind of um, highlighted by the shield counter mechanic which is a new mechanic as we'll see in one of our cards soon that lets you potentially save a creature by preventing damage or destruction and removing that shield counter. Then the next family is the Obscura family, which is white, blue and black, which is all about card draw and control, and highlighted by the Connive mechanic, which lets you draw and discard and potentially put some plus one counters on creatures with Connive. Then the Maestros is blue, black and red, cares about sacrifice and removal, and is highlighted by the casualty mechanic, which lets you sacrifice a creature, usually a small creature, to enhance one of your spells. Then the Riveteers is black, red and green, is all about aggro and big beaters, and highlighted by the Blitz mechanic, which is an alternate way of casting your creatures, by giving them haste and then sacrificing them end of turn, but also drawing a card in return and they often have neat enter the battlefield abilities to make up for it. And then the Cabaretti is red, green and white, 
and this is kind of the go wide archetype making a whole bunch of tokens and having creatures with the alliance mechanic which will enhance them if creatures enter the battlefield under your control so that's what the gabaretti are all about and my early prediction for this expansion is going to be that most decks are going to be three color but some of them might be four color which means you might for instance have a green white deck which overlaps with the brokers and the cabaretti and then you can have a light blue splash for a couple gold cards from the brokers and a light red splash for a couple red cards from the cabaretti and you can kind of do the same for a lot of the author families so i think four color decks with kind of a base of two colors and then a light splash of a third and fourth color is going to be quite common and you could probably see some five color good stuff decks in this format as well because mana fixing is plentiful in pretty much every color thanks to the cycle of dual lands and tri lands so i think uh, three colors is kind of the minimum but you could potentially end up in four or even five color decks as well so take that on board as we take a look at all the cards here so we'll start with the families and the first family is going to be the brokers so green white and blue and our first card is brokers ascendancy we're starting out strong a three mana rare enchantment saying at the beginning of your end step put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each planeswalker you control of course we're not expecting to have a lot of planeswalkers in limited but just a plus one counter on each creature every turn is going to quickly add up of course limited is all about creatures and most decks will have 15 plus creatures so broker's ascendancy is going to quickly accumulate a lot of value so as long as you have a high enough creature count and hopefully you can play ascendancy with a few creatures already in play it should be incredibly powerful so i think this is deserving of an a grade a bomb level card that I'm happy to pick early and then go into this family to kind of build around it. Next up we have a Broker's Charm, which is pretty solid. All these charms are going to be three colors, uncommons, instants, with three different modes to choose from. And in this case we've got a removal spell saying target creature you control gets plus one plus so until end of turn, and it deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. The second mode destroys an enchantment, and finally we can draw two cards. So the first and the third mode are probably going to be used more often, but having the flexibility of sometimes hitting an enchantment is always nice. So yeah, definitely a very solid charm, and gets a B grade, just solid removal with a ton of flexibility. Then we've got a Disciplined Duelist, 3 mana for a 2-1 Human Citizen at Uncommon with a Double Strike, and it enters a battlefield with a shield counter on it so this is the first time we're encountering a shield counter so if it would be dealt damage or destroyed remove a shield counter from it instead now this is not a may ability so if the opponent can somehow deal damage to a larger creature with a shield counter on it that's one way of removing that shield counter to later maybe destroy it but in either case you're usually getting a nice two for one out of the deal uh, shield counters I think are also going to be better on defense as opposed to offense because you can maybe set up a double block and then only lose a shield counter in the process as opposed to losing your creature whereas if you're attacking with a creature and it has a shield counter the opponent can still set up some profitable blocks without losing anything so yeah the duelist here seems like a pretty powerful card double strike is gonna play well with any additional pump effects or plus one counters and the shield counter gives it a bit of built-in protection so the duelist gets a b as well next we have endless detour a three mana rare it's an instant saying the owner of target spell non-land permanent or a card in a graveyard puts it on the top or bottom of their library so a very flexible instant here can sort of counter a spell even if the spell were uncounterable it still works so it's a little confusing there but uh, i'm sure it's going to see quite a bit of standard play as well but for limited it's still you know pretty solid flexible and not too expensive but uh, that being said if the opponent has some bomb it's not necessarily going to answer it because the opponent can just put it back on top of their deck so it's not the perfect answer but it is still quite flexible so i think i'm landing on c plus for endless detour might actually be more powerful in constructed than in limited next we have falco spara pact weaver a four mana mythic rare legendary bird demon it's a three three with flying and trample 
and Falco enters the battlefield with a shield counter on it, so again has that built-in protection, and says you may look at the top card of your library at any time, and you may cast spells from the top of your library by removing a counter from a creature you control in addition to paying their author costs. So, of course we can remove shield counters, but our creatures might also have plus one counters, thinking of the Broker's Ascendancy, for instance. So, you know, just a 3-3 flyer with trample with built-in protection that can provide information and maybe a little bit of card advantage seems like a very powerful card and worthy of an A bomb level card. And then we've got Lagrella, the magpie, a 3 mana 2-3, a legendary human soldier. And this one is a little bit tricky to parse, so instead of reading the card I'm just gonna try and explain what it does. It's essentially a Banisher Priest type card, so it enters a battlefield, can exile an opposing creature, if the opponent kills Lagrella, they get their creature back. But in addition, you can also exile your own creature alongside an opposing creature, and then if your creature comes back when Lagrella dies, it will enter the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it. So if you've got a small creature maybe with a nice enter the battlefield ability, you can exile it alongside an opposing creature, and then if the opponent wants to get their creature back and removes the Lagrella, then we also get our small creature back enhanced by those counters, and maybe triggering an additional enter the battlefield ability. So that's kind of the baseline scenario. And yeah, that makes this card quite powerful. Just having this kind of Banisher Priest at 3 mana is pretty decent, but you've got quite a bit of additional upside. So at the very least a C+, but I could see this kind of uh, inching towards the B category. Of course, 3 mana of 3 different colors means it's not the easiest to cast necessarily, even though it can come down early. But uh, yeah, just a powerful creature removal spell on a stick, basically. Then we have Rigo, Streetwise Mentor. This is our first appearance of the hybrid mana symbols. So if you haven't encountered these before, we can cast Rigo for triple white if we want to. We can cast it for a green, a white, and a blue. We can cast it for a green and double white, or a blue and double white. So we've got a ton of flexibility in how we want to cast Rigo, meaning that it's a pretty good first pick because it can go in a lot of different decks. And in this case we get a 2-2 legendary cat citizen at rare, and it enters with a shield counter on it. And whenever we attack a player or planeswalker with one or more creatures with power one or less, we get to draw a card. So it plays quite nicely alongside maybe small flying creatures. There's not a ton of those in the set, but can definitely add up in terms of uh, card advantage. And again, having that built-in protection with a shield counter is a big upside. So Rigo, I think, gets a B. If we had more small 1-1 flyers, for instance, then uh, Rigo would maybe even get to the A grade, but uh, kind of glancing at the set, I think B is where I end up. And then we have Soul of Emancipation, a 7 mana, 5 7 avatar at rare, and when it enters the battlefield, destroy up to 3 author target non land permanents, and for each one of those, its controller creates a 3 3 white angel creature token with flying. So we get a ton of flexibility here. We can not only destroy problematic permanents from the opponent, but we can also destroy our own permanents. And a lot of creatures in Limited are going to be worse than a 3-3 Flying Angel. So just killing some random 2 or 3 drops and turning those into angels can be quite the advantage. We could potentially create 9 power and toughness of flying creatures in addition of a 5-7. So yeah, ton of flexibility, can take out big problematic cards from the opponent, and potentially upgrade some of your own creatures as well. So I think this is a bomb, gets an A grade. And then Sparrow's Adjudicators is a 5 mana 4-4 four, four cat citizen at common. And this is going to be a cycle, as we'll see, of uh, these special creatures that we can exile for 2 mana from our hand. And then a target land gains the ability of tapping for 3 colors of the respective colors of that family. And then uh, we can potentially cast the creature from exile after using that ability, and then the land will no longer uh, fix your mana, basically. And in this case we get a 5 mana 4-4 four, four, that when it enters a battlefield says target creature an opponent controls cannot attack or block until your next turn. So we're mostly evaluating the adjudicators 
in terms of its mana fixing capabilities. The creature later in the game, of course, is a very nice upside, but uh, the mana fixing is what I'm kind of mostly focusing on. Now, if it only fixed your mana and then didn't do anything else, it would be a pretty bad card because it doesn't actually produce any additional mana. It's not an extra land we're playing, for instance. It only fixes our mana. But then having that late game flexibility of also having the five mana creature to play afterwards, of course, makes this quite good. And uh, yeah, the mana fixing, of course, vital in a set that's trying to play three colors and limited. So I think I'm going to give this entire cycle of creatures a C+, since they are just going to be important for mana fixing, and then even if the creature might be a little bit overcosted on the kind of backside, it's still definitely a card I'm going to play in every three-color deck of those respective colors, maybe even splashing uh, certain cards outside of the family that I'm maining, if you will. But uh, C+, for adjudicators. And then our next family is going to be Obscura. So this is the black, white, and blue family. And we're starting out with a Nimble Larcenist, 3 mana, 2 1, a bird rogue at uncommon. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand, and you choose an artifact, instant, or sorcery card from it and exile that card. So 3 mana for a 2-1 flyer is not really cutting it in limited these days. It's also not easiest to cast. So how good is this ability? I don't think it's amazing. Of course it's going to have its moments where the opponent is playing a ton of instants and sorceries, and then it could be a nice 2 for one But for the most part, limited decks consists of mainly lands and creatures, so you're not necessarily expecting to hit an instant or sorcery when you play this. So I'm not starting out super high on the Larcenist, and in fact I'm just going to give it a C. But uh, of course, if you're playing a best of three scenario, and you know for a fact that your opponent has a ton of expensive instants and sorceries, maybe some artifacts too, then the Larcenist will go up in value significantly. But I'm starting out relatively low here. Next is Obscura Ascendancy, a 3 mana rare enchantment, as all these ascendancies are saying whenever you cast a spell, if its mana value is equal to 1 plus the number of soul counters on Obscura Ascendancy, put a soul counter on it, and then create a 2-2 white spirit creature token with flying. And as long as there are 5 or more counters on the Ascendancy, spirits you control get plus 3 plus 3. So this is reminiscent of a red enchantment from one of the Amoncat expansions, I'll pull it up on the screen. But uh, yeah, this is a very tricky card to both build around and evaluate. You basically have to play Ascendancy, and then in order, play a 1-drop, then a 2-drop, then a 3-drop, etc. Which, you know, sounds somewhat feasible in uh, theory, but in practice it's just very clunky makes you play off curve, makes you draft a weird curve that you otherwise wouldn't want to draft, because you do really need a ton of one drops to even get this started, otherwise it just doesn't do anything. So all that taken into consideration, this is going to be one of the very few F grades that I'm going to hand out today. There will be kind of the dream scenario where you can draft around Ascendancy and you'll actually make it work. So it's not a card that has absolutely no potential, but I'm just making a statement here that you should be avoiding this in the first place, and then maybe once in a blue moon there will be a deck that can take advantage of it. And then next up we've got our Charm, which gives us the options of returning targets multicolored permanent, with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. We can counter target instant or sorcery, or we can destroy a creature or planeswalker with mana value 3 or less. So these aren't my favorite modes. We get kind of a negate and an eliminate, which are both fine cards, but they're cards we usually pay two mana for. So it's a little bit overcosted in that sense, and not as exciting as some of the other charms. Still, of course, a card I'm going to play if I'm playing these colors, since it's quite flexible and you know all the options are effects you would like to have in limited. Just a little bit overcosted, as I've said, so can't go higher than a C. Next up we have Obscura Interceptor, a 4-mana 3-1 Cephalid Wizard at rare with Flash and Lifelink. 
and when the Interceptor enters a battlefield, it connives, and when it connives this way, return up to one target spell to its owner's hand. So there's a lot to parse here, our first instance of connive, meaning we get to draw a card and then discard a card, and if we discarded a non-land card, put a plus one plus one counter on that creature. So drawing before discarding, of course, always a nice advantage, almost always worth doing if you get the chance, even if you've got some very good cards in hand. And then if we discard a non-land, we also get a plus one counter. That's going to mean that we have to sort of prioritize creatures or cards in general that might have some sort of effect once they're in the graveyard. We might want to prioritize graveyard recursion, so all these effects kind of go up in value if your deck has a lot of cards with connive in it, because that's just going to give you more value out of the graveyard, and uh, it's going to make it less of a feel bad when you have to discard a non-land card to get that plus one counter, which of course would make the connive mechanic a lot more powerful. So if we try and parse the Interceptor, it could potentially be a 4-2 creature with Flash and Lifelink, and then returning a spell, of course, means we have to play this at instant speed in response to the opponent casting their own spell. So we can essentially uh, make them spend the mana to replay it. So that's what makes this potentially powerful. If we're returning a spell with it, it's not going to ambush any card from the opponent. But then again, a 3-1 or a 4-2 typically isn't going to ambush much from the opponent unless they're attacking with a 1-1 token, maybe. So Interceptor you know, has a lot of stats and a lot of text. At the end of the day, it's not a bomb, but it's just kind of a, a good card that you're happy to have with a little bit of flexibility. So I think Interceptor gets a B, but might even be generous. Then we have the Augur of Agonies, a 4-mana, 3-4 Legendary Cephalid Advisor at Uncommon, saying whenever you draw a card, target opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So, yeah, pretty solid card, good stats, and will slowly drain the opponent while gaining life. And of course, Obscura is going to have quite a few additional card draw effects to keep triggering the ability. So this gets a pretty solid B for me. Then we have the Scheming Seer, a 3-mana 1-4 Legendary Sphinx Demon at Mythic Rare with Flying and Ward 1, meaning if the opponent tries to target or Scheming Seer with a spell or an ability, they will have to pay one additional mana, otherwise that ability or spell will get countered. And then whenever we attack, so it doesn't even have to involve or Sphinx, it can be another creature that's attacking, then the target attacking creature connives X, where X is the number of attacking creatures. So we get to draw X cards and then discard X cards, and put a plus one counter on that creature for each non-land card discarded that way. So yeah, that can quickly add up. Even if the Scheming Seer is the only creature we have in play, it can also start accumulating a few plus one counters, and then once we get multiple attacking creatures, it can get out of hand pretty quickly. Has a little bit of built-in protection, of course, just Ward 1 is not necessarily all that much, but the fact that it starts out at 4 toughness and just 3 mana and can potentially pick up additional plus one counters means that it can uh, quickly keep growing and uh, make it very difficult for kind of damage-based removal to take out our Sphinx. So yeah, the Scheming Seer seems like a very powerful card indeed and gets an A grade for me, a bomb. Not quite S tier, but uh, definitely worth first picking and building around. And then we've got the Shattered Seraph, which is part of that cycle I mentioned. This is a 7-mana 4-4 four, four flyer, and when it enters the battlefield you gain 3 life, and then has that mana-fixing ability. So as all these cards I'm going to give it a C+, happy to have it in any Obscura decks. And then at the Clever Conductor is one of these hybrid mana rares. It's a 3-1 a Legendary Human Rogue and rare, and when it enters the battlefield it connives, and whenever you discard one or more cards, exile them from your graveyard, and when the conductor dies, put the cards exiled with it into their owner's hands. Can potentially provide a nice bit of card advantage, discard non-lands early to let it pick up plus one counters, plays well with your other connive cards, and then later can maybe get those spells back. So the clever conductor seems quite decent, and uh, yeah, should get at the very least a 
B grade. Then we have Void Rend, another very flexible 3 mana removal spell, a rare instance saying it cannot be countered, and destroy target a non land permanent. Gets the job done and uh, gets a B, just one of these unconditional removal spells, relatively efficiently costed as well, and uh, happy to have it in any obscure deck as well, and could potentially be splashed. Then we get to our next family, which is going to be the Maestros, which is blue, black, and red. Starting out with the Glamour Thief, a 4 mana 2 4 legendary vampire rogue at uncommon with haste, and we can pay 1 mana and tap it to add a blue, a black, and a red, but we can only spend it to cast instant and or sorcery spells. And when the thief dies, we get to return up to one target instant or sorcery card from our graveyard to our hand. So yeah, there's a lot going on here. Making mana for instants and sorceries is kind of what the Maestros is all about, since this is one of the families that probably has the highest density of powerful instants and sorceries. And then getting back one of them when uh, the thief dies is definitely a nice upside. And uh, haste means we can potentially play the thief, and if we have some leftover mana, use the ability right away to cast a, a three mana instant or sorcery. So, pretty decent looking card, and I will give it a B. Seems pretty easy to get quite a bit of value out of it. Then we've got Corpse Appraiser, a three mana, three three vampire rogue at uncommon, and when it enters a battlefield, we can exile up to one target creature card from any graveyard. And if a card is put into exile this way, look at the top three cards of your library and then put one of those cards into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Yeah, exiling a creature, not too difficult to limit it, as creatures often tend to trade early on. And then just a nice 2 for 1, a 3-3 three, three that draws a card with a bit of card selection even. So yeah, seems like a B level card, a creature with a little bit of card advantage stapled on is a nice example of a B grade. Then we have Evelyn, the Covetous has hybrid mana, 5 mana total. It's a 2-5 legendary vampire rogue at rare, it has flash, and yeah, 2-5 can actually ambush some relatively large creatures. There's a couple 4-2 creatures in the set, this could potentially surprise block. And when Evelyn or another vampire enters the battlefield under our control, we can exile the top card of each player's library with a collection counter on it. And there's quite a few vampires in the Obscura, or uh, rather the Maestros family, so we can potentially trigger Evelyn more than once. And then once each turn, we may play a card from exile with a collection counter on it, and uh, if it was exiled by an ability you controlled, and you may spend mana as a third mana of any color to cast it. So we can even play lands, and then of course cast spells from the opponent as well, cast spells from our deck, so can uh, pretty quickly accumulate some card advantage. Not too difficult to cast, you know, the first two cards essentially, and then if we have any additional vampires, it can get out of hand pretty quickly. So I think Evelyn is deserving of an A, a bomb. Then we have a Glamorous, Outlaw, a uh, six mana, four five, common vampire rogue. So here we see yet another vampire, and when it enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to each opponent, and we scry two. Scry two once you get to six mana is quite useful because you can bottom any lands you find, and then it has that same mana fixing ability. So yet another C plus. This might be one of the better ones thanks to that scry two ability. And then Hostile Takeover is a 5 mana sorcery at rare, saying up to 1 target creature has base power and toughness 1-1 one, one until end of turn, and up to 1 has base power and toughness 4-4 four, four until end of turn, and then Takeover deals 3 damage to each creature. So we can turn a large creature from the opponent into a 1-1, one, one, while maybe turning one of our creatures into a 4-4, four, four, which would otherwise die to the 3 damage. So it's definitely better than your regular 3 damage sweeper, as it's essentially kill target creature from the opponent, in addition to dealing 3 damage, in addition to saving one of your creatures, and maybe getting a 4 extra damage out of the deal. 
So it's doing quite a lot. Now with that being said, sometimes it's just going to be 5 mana destroy target creature without doing too much else. So it kind of has to line up properly for it to be effective. There are quite a few creatures with high toughness in this uh, set. So 3 damage is not necessarily enough to kill a lot of the creatures it would normally hit. But uh, yeah, at the very least still a B. Uh, definitely has the potential to be more than just a B. But as a baseline it's again 5 mana to destroy a creature at the very least. And then we have Lord Xander the Collector. A 7 mana 6-6 six, six legendary vampire demon noble at mythic. And when a Lord Xander enters a battlefield, target opponent discards half the cards in their hand rounded down. Now, I wouldn't get too excited about this first ability because by the time you get to 7 mana, the opponent is likely to be empty handed anyway. So let's keep reading. When Lord Xander attacks, defending player mills half their library rounded down. Okay, so yeah, if we trigger this three or four times, then the game is probably over. But then again, if we're attacking three or four times unopposed with a 6-6, six, six, the game would probably be over anyway. So I'm also not too excited about the mill ability here. And then finally, when Lord Xander dies, target opponent sacrifices half the non-land permanence they control around it down. Yeah, that is quite powerful. Non-land permanence, of course they can choose to keep their most powerful ones. But uh, yeah, still definitely a lot of uh, potential value to be had. So I wouldn't get, you know, too excited about Lord Xander because it is still 7 mana and not all the abilities are necessarily relevant. But everything combined I think still makes something that is quite powerful. There is a couple ways to maybe like discard and reanimate it between connive letting you discard and then maybe a reanimation spell getting it back. But uh, kind of looking at the entire set, there's maybe only one or two ways to actually put it from the graveyard onto the battlefield, and we're not necessarily getting a huge discount. Expensive cards are probably better in this set than they would be otherwise, because decks tend to be slower if they play multiple colors, more mana bases that are off to a slow start, so you're less likely to get run over, which means that expensive and powerful cards like Lord Xander go up in value slightly. So I think I fall somewhere between a B and an A for Lord Xander. Um, but maybe the fact that this expansion is a little slower than usual makes me lean towards the A uh, for Lord Xander. But just be mindful that uh, there might be games where you die with Lord Xander in hand or you play it and it's just kind of a 6-6 six, six that doesn't really help you stabilize. Then we have Maestro's Ascendancy. A 3 mana enchantment at rare, saying once during each of your turns you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your graveyard by sacrificing a creature in addition to paying its other costs. And if a spell cast this way would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. We can sacrifice creatures to get additional value from our instants and sorceries. So this seems a little tricky to get going if you can uh, go through the set while there are a couple creatures you're happy to sacrifice, there's not nearly enough that I'm comfortable with uh, necessarily running a card like Maestro's Ascendancy, which requires quite a bit of setup. You need to have the Ascendancy, you need to have some creatures that you're willing to sacrifice, and then you need to have sufficient instances and sorceries to potentially replay. So that's asking a lot, and I think it's asking a little bit too much to the point where I think Ascendancy gets a D and uh, just uh, doesn't quite get there for me. But again, a card that under the right circumstances I'm sure can provide quite a bit of value. Then we have the Maestro's Charm, which lets us choose between looking at the top five cards of our library, putting one of them into our hand and the rest into our graveyard. Graveyard definitely has some additional upside if we have cards that can be returned from our graveyard or cards as we'll see later that get better if we have a lot of different mana values in our graveyard. So it's definitely better than putting them on the bottom of our library. Then we can also deal 3 damage to an opponent and gain 3 life. I guess technically it's not deal damage but lose life. 
And then finally we can deal 5 damage to target creature or planeswalker. So the mode we're going to use most often is probably the last one as a 3 mana removal spell. But the upside of uh, a little bit of card selection is not bad. So Maestro's Charm overall I think falls into the C plus camp. Not quite as powerful as let's say the uh, Broker's Charm we've seen. But uh, probably still uh, a card I'm happy to have in any Maestro's deck. And then we have the Maestro's Diabolist, a 3 mana 1 4 Vampire Warrior at rare with Death Dutch and Haste. And when it attacks, if we don't control a Devil token, we create a tapped and attacking 1 1 Red Devil creature token that when it dies and deals 1 damage to any target. So 1 4 with Death Dutch and Haste essentially makes a Devil token right away. And then if the opponent wants to block it, they probably need multiple blockers back to take out the four toughness and uh, you'll still get to probably kill something in the process while making additional devils. So yeah, the Diabolists can quickly provide quite a bit of board advantage and uh, it's going to be a nightmare for any deck with a lot of low toughness creatures. So at the very least a B. And that's our final Maestro's card. So it's time to switch over to the Riveteers, which is black, green, and red. Starting with Crew Captain, a 3-mana 4-2 Human Warrior and Uncommon, has haste, and it also has Indestructible as long as it entered the battlefield this turn. So the first attack is on the house, basically, can attack unopposed, and especially if you can cast it early in the game, it's unlikely for the opponent to be able to block it profitably. So it gets 4 damage in, and then it's a 4-2 creature afterwards. So not bad if you're looking to curve out and be aggressive. The more controlling Riveteers decks, probably not too interested in this. So kind of have to draft it accordingly. But uh, certainly a card with potential, and uh, gets a C+. Masked Bandits, part of the mana fixing cycle. A 6-mana 5-5 five five Raccoon Rogue with Vigilance and Menace, and can be exiled to fix her mana. So it gets a C plus like all the other cards. Then we have Mr. Orfeo, the Boulder, a 4 mana, 2 4 legendary Rhino Warrior at Uncommon, saying whenever you attack, double target creature's power until end of turn. So don't even have to attack with Mr. himself, and uh, yep, yeah, can certainly have a pretty big impact. Let's say we pair it with the 4-2 we've just covered. Now we're hitting for 8 potentially. So it doesn't take a lot of attacks to potentially end the game. So Mr. gets a B, B for Boulder. Next we have Ognis, the Dragon's Lash. A 4-mana hybrid, 3-3 legendary Vyashino warrior at rare, has haste, and says whenever a creature you control with haste attacks, create a tapped treasure token. And uh, of course Riveteers has quite a few haste creatures but also has a ton of creatures with the blitz mechanic which essentially gives the creature haste. So there might be a lot more haste creatures than you would expect at first glance. So Ognis definitely doesn't mess around. Treasures also incredibly valuable in a set with so many different colors and powerful cards you might want to splash for. So if you can play a turn for Ognis, the opponent doesn't have any favorable blocks lined up, then not only are you getting a treasure for next turn, but you can potentially snowball that mana advantage as well. So I think Ognis is deserving of an A, just gonna run away with a lot of games where you can play it on curve, not only fixing your mana, but ramping as well. And then of course the hybrid mana makes it pretty easy to cast under most circumstances. Then Riveteer's Ascendancy, as the other Ascendancy is a 3-mana rare enchantment, saying whenever you sacrifice a creature, you may return target creature card with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped, and can only do it once each turn. If we didn't have the context of Blitz, this card would be kind of unexciting, because there's not that many sacrifice effects in the set, but knowing that Blitz sacrifices a creature end of turn, means that all of a sudden Ascendancy actually starts getting a lot more exciting as you can 
potentially chain together some creatures to return from the graveyard. So I think Ascendancy has potential, still definitely a build around. Without any Blitz cards in your deck, you probably are not interested. But assuming you're in the Riveteers, I think you should be able to make it work. So C plus for Riveteers Ascendancy. Then we take a look at the Riveteers Charm, which I think is the most exciting of the charms. So 3 mana uncommon instant, letting us choose between making the opponent sacrifice a creature or planeswalker they control with the highest mana value among creatures and planeswalkers they control, which for the most part means their most valuable creature. Also important to note is that by making them sacrifice that creature, it kind of plays around potential shield counters, which protect from damage and destruction effects, but don't protect from sacrifice effects like Riveteer's Charm. Then the second mode lets us exile the top three cards of our library. Until our next end step, we may play those cards. So usually the timing on this is you want to cast this in the opponent's end step. So you get to untap and potentially cast all three cards. You can even uh, play uh, lands, I believe, because it says you may play. Yeah. So we can potentially, let's say we exile a land and two spells. We can play the land and both spells. And then now we've got a nice three for one. So has a lot of potential to provide card advantage, not a card you typically want to cast on turn 3, much better in the late game once you have more mana and you're more likely to be able to play all the exiled cards. And then finally we can also exile target player's graveyard, which is not going to come up very often, but just additional upside. So very flexible removal spell slash card draw spell gets a B. And then Unleash the Inferno is a 4 mana instant at rare, dealing 7 damage to target creature or planeswalker. And when it is dealt excess damage this way, we can destroy an artifact or enchantment the opponent controls with mana value less than or equal to that amount of excess damage. So could potentially be a nice 2 for 1. 7 damage is going to be enough to kill pretty much any creature in the set. And uh, 4 mana at instant speed is a pretty good deal. And then if you ever get to live the dream, of also destroying an artifact or enchantments, that's of course even better. So Unleash the Inferno gets at the very least a B. And then we have Ziatora, the Incinerator, a 6 mana 6-6 six, six legendary demon dragon at Mythic. It flies and says at the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice another creature, and when you do, the Incinerator deals damage equal to the creature's power to any target and you create three treasure tokens. In the context of the Blitz mechanic, we can potentially stack the Blitz sacrifice trigger and the incinerator trigger in such a way that we sacrifice to the incinerator first. So a creature that would have died anyways now also gets to deal a bunch of damage and uh, three treasures also not to be underestimated. Of course, it is still in a lot of circumstances a 6-6 flyer that the opponent has the chance to just take out in their turn, because for the most part if you play Ziatora you're not going to have the mana to also blitz another creature and uh, be able to sacrifice it to get full value. So it doesn't have any built-in protection necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have a big impact the turn you play it, unless maybe you control a creature that the opponent put a pacifism effect onto that you want to sacrifice anyway. The question here is, are we going all the way up to an S, or is it more of an A level card? And uh, while the dream case of combining this with Blitz creatures is definitely on my mind, there will also be situations where you play this and the opponent just untaps and kills it, and you didn't really get any uh, advantage out of it. So I think an A for Ziatora is still probably realistic. And then Ziatora's Envoy is a 4 mana 5 4. Viashino Warrior at rare, it has Trample, and it has Blitz, so I think this is actually the first Blitz creature we've seen. Blitzes for 5 mana, which means we can, uh, I guess there's no reminder text on this one, we can cast it for its Blitz costs from our hand, meaning it will enter the battlefield with haste, and the ability that end of turn we have to sacrifice it and draw a card. So with that in mind, when the Envoy deals combat damage to a player, we can look at the top card of our library, and we may play land from the top, or cast a spell with mana value less than or equal to the damage dealt from the top of our library 
without paying its mana cost. And if we don't, we can put it into our hand instead. Okay, so a lot to parse here. So 4 mana, 5 for Trampler, pretty good deal. Of course, the opponent is likely to still have enough power and toughness to just trade for it. But maybe we get a sneaky hit of Trample in to still get a bit of card advantage. But uh, of course, the exciting part is if we can Blitz the uh, Envoy, and let's say the opponent doesn't have any blockers out, then we're paying 5 mana to deal 5 damage. Look at the top of our library to potentially, best case scenario, cast like a 5 drop, for instance. And then we also get to draw a card from the Blitz end of turn. So yeah, that's quite a bit of value for 5 mana. Of course, there will also be times where the opponent doesn't have any good blockers for Envoy, and you can connect with it freely multiple times to provide advantage, but that's not going to happen all that often. So yeah, Envoy is certainly powerful. It's tempting to bump it all the way up to an A, but kind of uh, going back, I think it was War of the Spark, there was a very similar looking creature that provided a significant advantage if it managed to connect with the opponent. I don't remember it connecting very often, but uh, here we have the surprise factor of Blitz, which lets us put it into play with haste. So I think Envoy gets a B, but a very solid B at that. And now we go on to the Cabaretti, our final family, and this is green, white, and red. Starting out with a charm, the 3 mana uncommon instant, letting us choose between dealing damage equal to the number of creatures we control to target creature or planeswalker. So kind of a Kabira takedown. We can give our creatures plus 1 plus 1 and trample until end of turn. Or we can create two 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature tokens. Now making two tokens at instant speed has a few interesting implications in the set because of the alliance mechanic on a lot of uh, Cabaretti creatures, meaning we can potentially pump up our creatures or trigger all sorts of effects at instant speed, which uh, might catch the opponent off guard. So two tokens at instant speed, a lot better in this set than it would be otherwise. Now that being said, still not my favorite charm compared to, let's say, the Riveteer charm, I think. I would still rather have that one. But of course, the context is entirely different since you're going to be playing this in a go white deck that cares about making tokens and pumping those up. In which case, of course, Cabaretti Charm is going to fit in perfectly. So, still at the very least a C. Next is Brazen Upstart, a 3 mana 4 2 elf shaman and uncommon, has vigilance. And when it dies, we get to look at the top 5 cards of our library, reveal a creature card from among them and put it into our hand with the rest on the bottom in a random order. So 4-2 creature provides a bit of card advantage when it dies. 4-2 is likely to trade off for an opposing 2-drop, but if the opponent maybe didn't start out with a 2-drop, then uh, this could deal quite a bit of damage. And then you're pretty happy if this can trade off, because it's still going to provide a bit of advantage. And if you're kind of on the defensive instead, then having 4 power is actually pretty nice because it can potentially trade for the opponent's 4-drop and still get the trigger. So yeah, the upstart seems pretty solid and gets a B. Next we have the Cabaretti Ascendancy, 3-mana rare enchantment, saying at the beginning of our upkeep, look at the top card of our library, and if it's a creature or planeswalker card, we may reveal it and put it into our hand. If we don't, then we may put it on the bottom of our library instead. So yeah, in the late game, if we're hitting extra lands we don't need, at the very least we can put those on the bottom. So much better than having to draw them. And assuming you're in Cabaretti, you're going to have quite a few creatures. And uh, this should provide a lot of card advantage over the course of a long grindy game, which I'm kind of hoping and expecting this set to be. Uh, pretty grindy games with a lot of powerful multicolor cards being cast. So Ascendancy should be kind of the perfect card for that sort of format. So it gets a B. Next we have Fleetfoot Dancer. 4 mana, 4-4 four, four Elf, Druid and Rare. Has Trample, Lifelink and Haste. Wow, this card just uh, doesn't mess around. Comes down, hits the opponent right away. Makes it impossible to race. So pretty much demands an immediate answer. 
And if the opponent is out of answers, then they're out of luck, because this is going to kill them very quickly. So this seems like a bomb, I guess an A for sure. Then we've got the Incandescent Aria, a 3 mana rare sorcery, dealing 3 damage to each non-token creature. So Cabaretti, known for making a few tokens here and there. So this could, under the right circumstances, be a one-sided sweeper. Realistically, can maybe kill one or two creatures from the opponent, and uh, maybe after you've attacked and the opponent has blocked, this can also finish off one of their larger creatures that was already dealt a little bit of damage. So definitely a card with potential, and if you're heavy Cabaretti, you should have quite a few tokens that this can synergize with. So I'm leaning towards C+, staying kind of conservative here. Then we've got Jetmir, a Nexus of Revels, the 4-mana 5-4 legendary cat demon at Mythic, and has all sorts of abilities that scale as we control more creatures. So the first one is creatures we control get plus 1 plus 0 and have vigilance as long as we control 3 or more creatures. The next one is our creatures get plus 1 plus 0 and have trample as long as we control 6 or more creatures. So in that case we get both abilities, so we get plus 2 plus 0, vigilance and trample. And finally if we control 9 or more creatures then our team also gets plus 1 plus 0 and double strike. So that's plus 3 plus 0 total, Vigilance, Trample, and Double Strike. Although, of course, if you already had 9 creatures in play, you were probably already in a favorable position. So yeah, Jetmir, even if we kind of stay conservative and only look at the first ability, still quite powerful. So easily gets an A, bomb level card. Then we have Genie Fey, Jetmir's second Another one of these hybrid rares. It's a 3-3 legendary elf druid. And it says if we would create one or more tokens, we may instead create that many 2-2 green cat creature tokens with haste, or that many 3-1 green dog creature tokens with vigilance. This set makes a lot of 1-1 citizen tokens that we can upgrade, but there are also quite a few treasure tokens, especially in red that we can turn into creature tokens instead. So that's kind of the deck where Ginny Fey is going to shine. But even as a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, upgrading some citizens into cats or dogs is already quite nice. So it doesn't take much for Ginny Fey to completely take over the board. So I'm optimistic and I'm going to give Ginny an A. Then we have the Rakish Revelers, part of the mana fixing cycle. 5 mana, 5-3 five, elf druid rogue at common, and when it enters a battlefield create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. Keep that uh, creature type in mind, because there's a few cards that synergize with citizens, and outside of the citizen tokens there's also a few creatures in the set that have the citizen creature type, so those all play an important role in the set, and the revelers, like all the mana fixers, gets a C+. Then we have Rocco, Cabaretti, Caterer, X, Red, White, and Green for a 3-1 Legendary Elf Druid at Uncommon. So we can potentially cast this for X equals 0, making it a 3-mana three 3-1. Three Not that exciting, because when Rocco enters a battlefield, if you cast it, you may search your library for a creature card with mana value X or less, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle. So x equals 1, we get a free 1-drop, x equals 2, get to search a 2-drop, etc. So not sure where the sweet spot is for this, but certainly a powerful mana sink in the late game if you can search up pretty much any creature in your deck. And the fail case is still a 3-mana three 3-1, three which, while not exciting, at least still gives you a bit of a board presence. So ideally, if you're playing with Rocco, you want to have at least one one drop you can search up, so you can cast it for x equals 1 and still get some value. But uh, yeah, seems like a solid card. Um, the flexibility here is what makes it so powerful, being able to essentially tutor up different creatures. So I think a B for Rocco seems appropriate. Now it's time to switch over to the other multicolor cards in the set, and there's not a whole lot of them because, of course, we have all these 
triple colored cards from the families, but we do have a few two color cards. And uh, these, of course, synergize well with the families that have overlapping colors, but uh, they're a little bit more flexible because they don't necessarily force you to play their respective families. So getting started here, we've got Avon Heartstabber, a 2-mana 1-1 one, one bird assassin at rare with flying. When it dies, it mills 2 cards, and then you draw a card as well. And as long as there are 5 or more mana values among cards in your graveyard, then the Heartstabber gets plus 2 plus 2 and has Death Touch. So Heartstabber plays especially well with the Maestros, which have a few cards that care about putting cards in the graveyard or taking a look at the Maestro's Charm, which could potentially fill your graveyard with a whole bunch of different mana values. And then also it's the family that has the the casualty mechanic, which kind of wants you to sacrifice creatures to enhance some of their spells. So that's where the Heart Stabber is going to be at its best. And even the fail case where it never gets Death Touch and plus two plus two is still not all that bad. Question here is, are we going for B or do we stay conservative with a C plus? We'll start with the C+, since getting 5 mana values in the graveyard is still quite the challenge. Next we have Black Market Tycoon, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, Cat Rogue at rare, this is red-green. And at the beginning of your upkeep, it deals 2 damage to you for each treasure you control. So this is a drawback, but we can tap it to create a treasure token. So, potentially a very powerful ability. Let's say we play this on turn 2, turn 3 make a treasure, and then all of a sudden turn 4 make another treasure, we can cast a 6 drop already. So kind of has that explosive potential which a regular 2 mana ramp creature ne wouldn't necessarily have. So it does have that going for it. The drawback is you might take quite a bit of incidental damage, not the best synergy with other cards that create treasures, and if you draw it later in the game then it's kind of a glorified 2-drop. That's just a 2-2, two -two basically. So, has potential. Um, if you have this in the deck, maybe avoid having too many other treasure makers, otherwise you're going to be forced to sacrifice them so you don't take too much damage. But uh, yeah, when played on turn 2, probably one of the scarier cards you can sit across in a game of limited. So, C+. Plus. I think is a fair compromise, taking that explosive potential into consideration, as well as the potential drawback. Next we have Body Dropper, a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two Devil Warrior at common, in red-black, saying whenever you sacrifice another creature, put a plus one plus one counter on it, and for 2-mana we can sacrifice another creature ourselves, and then the Body Dropper gains menace until end of turn. So red-black goes into the Maestro's deck, which already has quite a few cards that want you to sacrifice stuff, which is where the Body Dropper is going to be at its best, being able to passively pick up plus one plus one counters. So C+, plus, assuming you have some other sacrifice effects and maybe those casualty cards. Celestial Regulator is a 3-mana 2-3 Angel Advisor at common, it has flying, and when it enters a battlefield, choose target creature you don't control and tap it. If you control a creature with a counter on it, the chosen creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So blue-white flyer plays nicely into the broker's family, which will have a few shield counters, maybe plus one counters, floating around. And so the regulator can keep an opposing creature tapped down. And then, yeah, 2-3 flyer with that ability seems pretty decent, so C plus for Regulator. Ceremonial Groundbreaker is a 3-mana uncommon artifact equipment in green-white. Equips a Citizen for just 1 mana, so I mentioned earlier there's quite a few cards making Citizen tokens, but there's also a few creatures that have the Citizen creature type, and if we can equip this for just 1 mana, we get a 2-mana discount, which is quite significant. And then it gives the equipped creature plus two plus one and trample. And otherwise equips for three mana. So for not equipping a citizen, I'm not that excited about this since we're paying six mana to get the first tangible benefit. If we're equipping a citizen, then four mana is 
more reasonable, especially if we can keep equipping more citizens afterwards. Turning 1-1 one, one creatures into 3-2 tramplers is uh, quite the upgrade, especially in grindy games. So a card with potential, but can be a little bit slow to get going. And not every deck necessarily has a high density of citizens. So I'm starting out with a more conservative C on Groundbreaker, but if your deck has ample citizens, then it will go up in value significantly. Civil Servant, a 2-mana, two 2-3 two, cat citizen. So here we see an example of a citizen creature. It's a common in green-white, and when it attacks, you may tap another untapped citizen you control. And if you do, the servant gets plus one plus zero and gains a lifelink until end of turn. Yeah, if we can be attacking with a 3-3 lifelinker as early as turn 3, then that's going to make it difficult for the opponent to race. So, once again, a card with quite a bit of potential. C+, plus, I think, for servant, because the fail case is a 2-mana two 2-3, two which is already kind of above the curve. Corpse Explosion, a 3-mana black-red rare, a sorcery saying as an additional cost to cast it, exile a creature card from your graveyard, and then explosion deals damage equal to the exiled creature's power to each creature and each planeswalker. So where is Corpse Explosion going to be at its best? Presumably in the Riveteers uh, family, which has all those Blitz creatures with high power, where this can be a nice board wipe. Still a card that does require a little bit of setup, you're not always going to have a creature ready to go of the required power, but a C plus at the very least, because it does have quite a bit of uh, potential when it all lines up. Darling of the Masses, 4 mana, 2 4 elf citizen at uncommon, saying other citizens you control get plus 1 plus 0, oh, and when the Darling attacks, create a 1 1 green and white citizen creature token. Okay, 2 4 is pretty sturdy, so can realistically attack a few times without dying, making, in this case, 2-1 citizen tokens in the process. And if you already have a few citizens out, it can also have an immediate impact at the turn you player. So the Darling seems uh, quite powerful, and I think I'm even going up to a B. Green and white, also colors that tend to have quite a few combo tricks, so you can uh, attack kind of uh, unscathed if the opponent has a few blockers back. Exotic Pets, a 3-mana instant at uncommon in blue-white, creating a pair of 1-1 one, one blue fish creature tokens that cannot be blocked. So yeah, that seems very powerful. And then for each kind of counter among creatures you control, put a counter of that kind on either one of those tokens. So let's say we have a bunch of shield counters, on our creatures in play, then maybe one of our fish tokens can pick up a shield counter, maybe we've got a plus one counter in addition to a shield counter, and we can split those up or maybe make, I guess, a 2-2 fish with a shield counter on it, so there's quite a bit of flexibility. And even in the scenario where it's just making two unblockable fish tokens, it's not too bad, assuming your deck is somewhat aggressive or has a lot of good blockers and just needs an evasive creature to close out the game. Probably going to be at its best in the Brokers family, green, white, and blue, where there's the highest density of uh, beneficial counters. So yeah, Exotic Pets gets a B, a card with a lot of potential. Fatal Grudge, a 2-mana uncommon sorcery in red-black. As an additional cost to cast it, we have to sacrifice a non-land permanent, so for the most part going to be a creature, but could also be an author, uh, non-land permanent potentially. And then each opponent chooses a permanent they control that shares a type with the sacrifice permanent and sacrifices it. And then we also draw a card. So kind of a clunky edict effect that forces us to sacrifice, but also replaces itself by drawing a card. Edict effects, cards that make the opponent sacrifice a creature are typically not that amazing in limited, since they can often just sacrifice their weakest creature. Here we can also, let's say, sacrifice an artifact, and if the opponent only has one powerful artifact in play, they will be forced to sacrifice that one instead. But that's kind of a, an edge case scenario that's probably not going to come up all that often. So Fatal Grudge, probably playable 
in the right deck that has a lot of sacrifice fodder, thinking of those Maestro's decks mainly, but not a card I'm excited about, so C. Forge boss, a 4-mana 3-4 human warrior at Uncommon, saying whenever you sacrifice one or more other creatures, the boss deals 2 damage to each opponent, only triggers once each turn. Yeah, not particularly excited about Forge Boss. Red, black, especially blue, black, red maestros will have the highest density of sacrifice effects thanks to the casualty mechanic, so you can expect a Forge Boss to maybe deal some incidental damage. But a 3 4, especially in these colors, you expect to maybe get something a little bit better and only damages opponents, so it's not like the Forge Boss is going to take out opposing creatures or anything. I guess another note about Forge Boss is that it also plays well with the uh, Blitz creatures from uh, the Riveteers, which will also be sacrificed end of turn. So I guess that maybe bumps up the, the value of Forge Boss slightly, the fact that it both works with the uh, Maestros as well as the Riveteers to a C plus at the very least. And um, I guess same can be said for the Fatal Grudge we've covered earlier. If you can Blitz a creature and cast Fatal Grudge in the same turn, that's kind of the best case scenario, but that's also going to require a lot of mana to set that all up. So I, th I think I still stand by C for Fatal Grudge, but uh, Forge Boss might bump up to a C plus and could fit nicely into an aggressive Blitz deck as opposed to maybe the Maestro's deck. Jetmir's Fixer, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, Cat Warrior at common, and for a red and a green it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, and if mana from a treasure was spent to activate this ability, it gets a plus one counter instead. And yeah, red green does have quite a few cards making treasure tokens. So if we can reliably keep putting plus one counters on the fixer, it can uh, turn into a pretty significant threat. Plays quite well with the black market tycoon we covered earlier. So C plus for Jetmir's fixer seems like a powerful two drop even without a whole bunch of treasures. Just a threat of activation is uh, worth respecting. Next we have Meeting of the Five. This is eight mana total, including all five colors, for a Mythic Rare Sorcery, exiling the top ten cards of our library, and we may cast spells with exactly three colors from among them this turn, adding two of each color to our mana pool. We can spend this mana only to cast spells with exactly three colors. So yeah, that's a lot to parse. This will play well in that crazy 4-5 color deck, playing as many powerful 3 color cards as possible. So I do expect this to actually end up in some decks and be powerful, especially if the format ends up being somewhat slow. Do you expect to cast Meeting of the Five every time you draw it? Probably not. Yeah, the grindier the format, the better this is gonna end up being. And... Uh, yeah, it's certainly going to be kind of an achievement unlocked if you can cast this and cast, let's say, three or four spells off of it. But it's probably not going to happen very often. So I don't recommend first picking Meeting of the Five and going for the crazy 4-5 color deck, especially if this is one of your first drafts of the format. But it's going to be the type of card you're hoping to open later in the, the format to kind of freshen things up and keep things exciting. So I'm going to say D for Meeting of the Five, but uh, I'm certainly looking forward to casting it at some point. Metropolis Angel, a 4-mana 3-1 Angel Soldier at Uncommon. It flies and says whenever you attack with one or more creatures with counters on them, draw a card. So it plays well in the Brokers with all those shield counters potentially. And a 3-powered Flyer for 4-mana you know, can certainly present a clock. If your deck doesn't have any counters whatsoever, then I'm not that interested in Metropolis Angel. But under most circumstances, you should be able to at least have a few counters floating around to provide card advantage. And uh, C plus for Metropolis Angel also works well with Connive in blue. That's a fair point. Plus one counters can also enable it. Obnixilus the Adversary is a 3-mana Mythic Rare Planeswalker in red-black, starts out at 3 loyalty, and uh, has Casualty X. Most Casualty cards have a number, but this is X, and uh, that means that as we cast it, 
we may sacrifice a creature with power X. And when we do, we get to copy of Nixilis. And in this case, it has the additional text saying that the copy isn't legendary and then has starting loyalty X. So that's a lot to parse. Best case scenario, we play an early expendable creature, play up Nixilis turn three, make a copy of it, which maybe starts out on one or two loyalty. And then we have two active planeswalkers. And then what's next? We probably start by using the minus two on the original Obnixilis, making a 1-1 one -one devil that when it dies deals one damage to any target. And then the copy of Obnixilis can use the plus one ability, making each opponent lose two life unless they discard a card. And if we control a demon or devil, which we now do thanks to the minus two, we also gain two life. And now we have two active planeswalkers, a chum blocker, and uh, we can slowly start draining the opponent while gaining life. So yeah, that's kind of the best case scenario for Obnixilis. A worst case scenario, I guess you draw this in the late game, but then you might have a larger creature you can sacrifice to casualty, to have two planeswalkers with more loyalty, can maybe make two devils right away, and that's still not too bad. So yeah, I think Obnixilis is a bomb-worthy card, um, just because it kind of puts the opponent in this awkward spot where they now have two planeswalkers they need to take out while trying to get past a couple devil tokens perhaps, which can take out two toughness creatures or multiple one toughness creatures. And then if you ever get to seven loyalty, you can minus seven, saying target player draws seven cards and loses seven life, which you can use to finish off an opponent who's at seven or less, or you can use it to draw a ton of cards. And thanks to the life gain from the plus one, you probably have seven life to spare. So yeah, I think an A for Obnixilis, even though it may not be the most obviously powerful card at first glance. Next we have Park Heights Pegasus, a 2-mana, two 2-1 two rare Pegasus, has Flying and Trample. And when the Pegasus deals combat damage to a player, we get to draw a card if we had two or more creatures enter the battlefield under our control this turn. So if no creatures entered, then it doesn't do anything, just a 2-1 Flying Trampler. But uh, in a Cabaretti deck that can make a few creature tokens, then the Pegasus could provide a nice bit of card advantage. And a 2-mana, two 2-powered two Flyer is already quite decent. So the uh, Pegasus has a lot going for it, and uh, probably gets a B, assuming you can produce enough creatures, especially cards that maybe make a creature token when they enter the battlefield. It's going to make it easier to keep enabling it and drawing more cards. Scheming Fence, a 2-mana, two 2-3 two, human citizen at rare in blue-white. When it enters the battlefield, you may choose a non-land permanent, and activated abilities of the chosen permanent cannot be activated. So there's a ton of different applications for this, but mostly shutting down creatures with activated abilities. And then the Scheming Fence has all activated abilities of the chosen permanent except for loyalty abilities, which would be a, a little strange. And then you may spend mana as a third war mana of any color to activate those abilities. So pretty flexible. Now there's not that many creatures with activated abilities. So don't expect all these extra lines of text to be incredibly relevant. But of course it's just upsides stapled onto a 2 mana 2-3, which is already not too bad. C plus for scheming fence seems fine. Security Rocks is a 4 mana 5-4 Rhino Warrior at Uncommon. And we can pay a red and a green rather than pay the spell's mana cost, but we can only spend mana produced by treasures to cast it this way. So we're not going to cast Security Rocks on turn 2, but it does potentially let us double spell very efficiently in the late game if we manage to make a few treasure tokens. So I wouldn't necessarily value that alternate um, casting mode too highly, but at the end of the day it's still a 4 mana 5-4 with upside. So it's okay, but I think I'm still not giving it more than a C. Then Snooping Nuzi is a 2 mana 2-2 two, two human rogue at common. When it enters the battlefield, mill 2 cards. 
and as long as there are five or more mana values among cards in your graveyard, it gets plus one plus one and has a lifelink. So there's a couple cards we've seen already that potentially get better with uh, five or more mana values in our graveyard. This is one of them. Can help enable it as well by milling two cards. Lands have mana value of zero, so that's an easy one to achieve, but then we still need four additional ones. So don't expect it to be easy to enable the newsy. Then again, it's also upside on top of a two mana two two C plus for the human rogue stimulus package for mana uncommon enchantment in red green. When it enters, creates two treasure tokens. So we can potentially play a stimulus package and play the rocks in the same turn. Although, of course, we could just play the rocks for four mana at that point. And we can also sacrifice a treasure to create a 1 1 green and white citizen creature token. And that's an ability we can potentially activate at instant speed. Makes it a bit more difficult for the opponent to attack into your creatures if you also have a stimulus package and a bunch of treasures in play. Yet, yeah, still potentially just a way to ramp into your more powerful and expensive cards. So it can maybe help you enable a splash that otherwise wouldn't quite work out. And if you have any other ways of making treasures, thinking back to the uh, Black Market Tycoon, you can now turn a treasure every turn into a 1-1 citizen. That seems very exciting as well. Definitely a card that has to be built around a little bit by itself. Not that exciting for mana for, let's say, two citizens. But it does have quite a bit of flexibility as well by uh, potentially helping you fix your mana or ramp, turning additional treasures into citizens. So I wouldn't underestimate Stimulus Package, and I'm going to land on a C+. Syndicate Infiltrator, 4 mana, 3-3 three, three Vampire Wizard at Uncommon. It flies, and as long as there are 5 or more mana values among cards in your graveyard, the Infiltrator gets plus 2, plus 2. So now we're talking about a 4 mana, 5-5 five, five Flyer. That definitely adds up, can kill the opponent in a couple attacks. But again, we have the challenge of getting those in the graveyard in the first place. So don't read this as a 4 mana 5-5, five, five, but rather a 3-3 three, three Flyer that sometimes will get the bonus. So overall, what do we rate Syndicate Infiltrator? I think C plus is uh, probably realistic and uh, hopefully we'll be able to make it a 5-5 often enough. Tainted Indulgence, 2 mana, uncommon instant that draws 2 cards, but we have to discard a card unless there are 5 or more mana values among cards in our graveyard. Under the right circumstances, an efficient card draw spell. Besides the connive mechanic, which can help us discard cards to enable a lot of these blue-black uh, gold cards. The fact that Tainted Indulgence, for instance, also makes us discard a card, can help enable other cards that are similar that want to have those five mana values in Graveyard. There's probably more ways to fill the Graveyard in this set than might be obvious at first glance. Again, thanks to the Connive mechanic, the uh, Sacrifice mechanic with Casualty can also potentially help you put additional creatures in the Graveyard. Blitz also puts some more expensive creatures in the graveyard potentially. So all these mechanics are ways to help enable these blue-black cards. And uh, just to say that Tainted Indulgence is uh, not a bad card and gets a C plus as well. First white card is Angelic Observer, a 6 mana, 3-3, three, three, uncommon angel advisor. That costs one generic mana less to cast for each citizen we control and has flying. So of course we're going to want to play this in our Cabaretti decks that can make a whole bunch of citizen tokens. And we might have some creatures with the citizen creature type as well. So it's going to be important to keep an eye out for the citizen creature type. And overall I'm pretty happy with Angelic Observer as a 3-3 a three, three flyer that's Ideally, we can cast around, let's say, three mana if we control three citizens. I think it's realistic for a deck that's kind of dedicated to that theme. So C plus for Observer. Backup Agent, a two mana, one one human citizen. So here we see yet another citizen creature. It's a common and it enters, 
putting a plus one plus one counter on target creature. We've seen a few cards that synergize with having other counters, like the uh, blue-white instance making those uh, fish tokens that can potentially accumulate extra counters, and uh, so that's where the backup agent is going to be at its best, in kind of the broker's uh, family, but of course can fit into any deck and is quite flexible, can essentially play it as a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two early, but late game that plus one counter might be more useful elsewhere. So the flexibility is quite nice, and for any limited deck it's important to have enough early plays so you don't get to run over. So C plus for backup agent. Ballroom Brawlers, 5 mana, 3 5 human warrior at uncommon, and when it attacks, then the Brawlers and up to one other target creature you control both gain your choice of first strike or lifelink until end of turn. Alright, so we're getting quite a few keywords here. A 3 5, not necessarily the biggest attacker, but also difficult to take out in combat, especially if we also give it first strike. And then can maybe give one of our flyers lifelink and make it difficult for the opponent to race. On the one hand, a 3-5 is a good blocker, so if you're on the defensive, it's still doing a reasonable job, even if you're not necessarily triggering the lifelink and first strike. But if you're on the offensive, especially alongside maybe an evasive creature, then uh, you're also getting a pretty good deal. So it's kind of okay in both scenarios, which is an important property for a card like this. I'm probably going to land on a C plus for Ballroom Brawlers, and hopefully it pans out. Next we have Boon of Safety, a 1 mana instant at common, putting a shield counter on a target creature, and we get to scry 1. So quite flexible, can essentially save a creature from removal or make combats go your way. Although it doesn't increase power or toughness, it doesn't necessarily let you trade up your, let's say, 2-drop for the opponent's 3 or 4-drop necessarily. But it could be very useful in like a, a double block scenario where opponent attacks, you double block, and then you put the shield counter on the first creature that's being assigned damage, and then now maybe you don't lose anything while killing the opponent's creature. So I think Boon of Safety will fit better into a more defensive deck that maybe has high toughness creatures trying to block on the ground alongside some evasive creatures, so you can also protect those with your boon of safety, as opposed to your typical aggro deck uh, that wants to attack on the ground. So I think this will fit better into kind of the broker's family, as opposed to maybe a cabaretti trying to go wide, which does make sense because the shield counter also synergizes better with cabaretti. But uh, yeah, still one mana for a combo trick with a lot of potential, I think, deserving of a C. Next is a Broker's Initiate, a one mana 04 cat citizen at common, and has a hybrid activated ability for five mana, either green or blue, so quite flexible there. And then the Initiate has base, power, and toughness 5-5 five, five until end of turn. One mana 04 reasonable blocker early, so if you're looking for an early kind of defensive option, the initiate will do, soak up quite a bit of damage, and then later in the game can turn into a 5-5 five, five beater, which is, yeah, quite significant, closes out the game in a couple attacks. So in a broker's deck that has that combo of high toughness creatures on the ground, with inevitability in the late game, either through evasive creatures or card advantage or some bomb, then the initiate I think is quite good. If your deck doesn't fit that description, I'm not too excited about Broker's Initiate, because while Threat of Activation is nice, being able to represent pumping the initiate into a 5-5 um, and having the opponent respect that means you can maybe keep up a whole bunch of mana which either represents the ability or another instant you can play instead if the opponent doesn't attack into your potential 5-5. Five -five. But it only works on defense and not on offense, because if you attack with an 0-4 with 5 mana untapped, the opponent's just going to take it, and then, you know, if you don't pump, it's not really accomplishing anything. I think I'm landing pretty low on it overall, 
but I do recognize its potential. So starting out with a, a pretty low D for initiate, but I can definitely see myself playing it in a deck that I kind of mentioned earlier, where you just want that early defensive option paired with inevitable late game. Next we have By Your Silence, a 5-mana common sorcery, exiling target a non-land permanent, but its controller creates a treasure token. This does get around shield counters, because shield counters don't protect from exile effects, so that's kind of a, a unique property that not many other removal spells have, because most removal will be damage-based or just, say, destroy, so there's not many exile removal spells. So that's definitely a big upside. The downside is we're paying 5 mana for it, and we're giving the opponent a treasure token, which some decks will be able to take advantage of quite nicely, both fixing their mana and ramping into bigger and better plays. So I'm not excited about By Your Silence, but maybe as a one-off in your deck, as kind of a contingency in case the opponent has some unbeatable bomb, especially if it's paired with a shield counter. I could see myself playing uh, one copy, so a C for By Your Silence. Celebrity Fencer, 4 mana, 3-2, Elf Druid at common with Alliance. So I think this is the first time we're actually seeing Alliance on a card. And uh, this says, whenever another creature enters a battlefield under your control, which is basically all what Alliance means, doesn't specify what happens, just that something happens. In this case, put a plus one plus one counter on Celebrity Fencer. So at four mana, the turn we play it, definitely below the curve as a 3-2. Assuming we can untap with it and maybe play one or two creatures, the Fencer will quickly become a significant threat. So yeah, in a Cabaretti deck, which is where you want to play this, you should be able to grow it pretty quickly. If you maybe curved out, played your 2 and 3 drops on curve, how many creatures do you still have in hand to keep growing the fencer, which at 4 mana is kind of expensive. That's kind of the main concern. So I think fencer falls somewhere between a C and a C+. I'm going to be conservative and start out with a C, but on a stalled board especially, this could help you take over. Citizen's Crowbar, a 2 mana uncommon artifact equipment and it comes attached to a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token, giving it plus 1 plus 1 and the ability to pay white mana, tap it, sacrifice citizen's crowbar, and destroy target artifact or enchantment, and then later equips for 2 mana. So I'm always a big fan of these equipments that come kind of pre-attached to a creature, as in this case we're, we're essentially getting a 2 mana 2-2, two, two, with a ton of additional flexibility, potentially taking out an artifact or enchantment, or we can move the equipment somewhere else if it's more convenient. So Crowbar C+, a very solid card. Dapper Shieldmate is a 4 mana 2-2 two, two human soldier at common, and it enters with a shield counter on it, and as long as it's your turn, the Shieldmate gets plus 2 plus 0. Oh. So attacks as a 4-2, and uh, the first attack that the opponent blocks gets uh, kind of protected thanks to the shield counter. So dream scenario, you attack with this, the opponent trades away like their 2 or 3 drop, and then they can maybe finally trade off for it. Now that's not always going to happen, sometimes the opponent has a larger creature that can easily block this, and then, you know, it doesn't matter that you have a shield counter. Sometimes you're the one on the defensive, and then this is just a 4-mana 2-2 two -two with a shield counter, which, you know, a shield counter still helps when double blocking, but it's not where you want to be, paying 4-mana for only 2 power and toughness. That makes this card a little awkward. Also the fact that shield counters kind of synergize more within the broker's uh, family, and the brokers, from the looks of it, tend to be more defensive, trying to take over the late game. And this is a card that wants to be turning sideways. Makes me less uh, enthusiastic about it. So, yeah, Damper Shieldmates. It might be a little harsh, because I might be underestimating the shield counter and how that plays out. 
but uh, I think I'm giving Shield Made a D, a D for Dapper. Depopulate, a 4 mana, a rare sorcery, saying each player who controls a multicolored creature draws a card, and then destroy all creatures. Sweepers and Limited are typically quite powerful. Um, it's just about how do you sell that fact to your opponent that they kind of overextend into it. You don't want to do nothing, because then the opponent is going to be very suspicious and hold back some of their cards. So you kind of have to, you know, play one or two creatures, maybe with Enter the Battlefield abilities early, and kind of uh, sell your opponent that you don't have a, a sweeper, and then it's going to be at its most effective the turn after the opponent slams their final creature, or maybe some bomb. In this set, there are going to be a ton of multicolored creatures, so this is likely going to draw the opponent a card. But then again, if you set it up properly, then you can also draw a card off of it. So that also kind of makes up for it, I guess. So at the end of the day, a 4-mana Wrath of God effect in limited uh, can't really get less than an A, which is what we'll give it here. Next is Elspeth, Resplendent, 5-mana, five, 5 loyalty, Planeswalker and has a plus one ability, saying choose up to one target creature, put a plus one plus one counter on it, so that happens no matter what, and then we can choose a counter from among flying, first strike, lifelink, or vigilance. So a ton of flexibility here. If you're on the defensive, then maybe something like first strike is gonna be more useful. If you're applying pressure, something like flying, Vigilance could be incredibly useful. Combining multiple of those counters, let's say making a huge flying, vigilant, life-linking creature, is going to make it impossible for the opponent to race. If you don't have any creatures in play, Elspeth is not going to do a whole lot, because you can only really count on the minus three, which is probably not that exciting in limiteds where you can't build your entire deck around it saying look at the top seven cards of your library, putting a permanent card with mana value three or less from among them onto the battlefield with a shield counter on it. So it does protect whatever you find, hopefully a creature, but it's only mana value three or less, so it's going to be kind of small. So if you're playing Elspeth using the minus, even if you find a creature, the opponent's likely to take out Elspeth. So she's not necessarily all that amazing when you're behind on board, but if you're at parity or slightly ahead on board, she's going to make sure that you're going to take over the game in no time. And then the minus seven is actually pretty achievable, making five three three white angel creature tokens with flying. So that can also completely take over the game. So Elspeth Resplendent, hesitant to give it an S because it doesn't have that built-in removal that can help you when you're very far behind on board, but uh, hopefully you're at least somewhere around parity, and then those uh, extra counters will carry you to victory. So Elspeth gets an A, bomb level card for sure. Extraction Specialist, 3 mana, 3-2 three, human rogue at rare, has lifelink, and when it enters the battlefield, Return target creature card with mana value 2 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and that creature cannot attack or block for as long as you control the specialist. Gonna be at its best if you can maybe get back a creature that you're planning to maybe sacrifice to another effect, or a creature with some activated ability or other utility that can still be useful even if it cannot attack or block. But even, you know, without that, it's still a 3-2 lifelinker that can maybe get something back from the graveyard, and then if the specialist dies, now your 2-drop can also attack and block. So it's not really asking a whole lot of you, other than that you play a sufficient number of cheap creatures to get back. And uh, yeah, overall specialist seems above average for uh, a 3-drop, that's for sure. So B for extraction specialist. A gathering Throng, a 3-mana, three 3-1 three human citizen at common, and when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for any number of cards named Gathering Throng, reveal them, and put them into your hand. So kind of your, I guess, Squadron Hawk, there was the 
the Conquistador a few cents back, and we've seen a few of these over the years. So a three drop, finding additional copies of itself, and always an interesting challenge during the draft. How early do you take the first gathering throng? Do you hope to wheel it? And uh, if anyone else is going for the st same strategy, it's probably not going to be all that great. But if you're the only one, then I think the sweet spot is probably like either four or five gathering throngs. That way uh, you're less likely to have a ton of them in your opening hand, but you can still string together a few of them, providing quite a bit of uh, card advantage. But I probably wouldn't want uh, more than five copies of this, otherwise we're playing a lot of three mana three ones that uh, aren't all that exciting. Yeah, definitely a fun build around challenge for limited and uh, a card with potential. So we're going to start out with kind of an ambitious C+, but uh, this is a card that will vary greatly from one draft to another based on whether any anyone else is kind of going for the same strategy. If you can, you know, reliably wheel Gathering Throng, then it's going to be much better for you. Next we have Jada, Font of Hope, 2 mana, 2-2, two, two, Legendary Angel at rare, has Flying and Vigilance, and can tap to add white mana that we can only spend to cast an Angel spell. So this is going to be amazing for Constructed. In Limited, how many Angels are there in the set? Not that many. Um, but we will see a very powerful angel at common in just a second. And then each author angel you control enters a battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it for each angel you already control. So it just keeps on giving here if uh, you've got a nice angel tribal deck. So yeah, Jada still at the end of the day a two mana, two two flyer with vigilance. So that's a ton of keywords, even if you're never tapping it for mana or playing another angel. And it doesn't take many other angels to completely take over the game. So at the very least a B. But uh, if you're lucky enough to get a ton of angels, Jana's going to be an absolute bomb. Halo Fountain, 3 mana, Mythic Rare Artifact slash Alternate Wing Condition. Can pay a white mana, tap it, and untap a tapped creature you control to create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. Untapping a tapped creature is something we've seen in the past with the untap symbol. So this kind of works in a similar space. The question here is how reliably can we tap a creature without having it die? It's not like we have the convoke mechanic to work with in the set as kind of a way to tap our creatures without having to attack with them. That's going to be a little tricky. Uh, there is another equipment in the set which we will see at the end of the set review which uh, we'll tap our creatures end of turn, so that's maybe a way to combo with Halo Fountain. But for the most part, it's going to require us to attack with our creatures. And then the, the payoff is we get to make a 1-1 one, one Citizen, which, you know, is pretty good. But we need to make quite a few of those to make up for it. If you have a few vehicles, that's another great way to tap your creatures without attacking with them. And while there aren't a ton of vehicles, they're mostly at higher rarity. Uh, you should still be able to pick up one or two if you can grab a Halo Fountain early. So vehicles are probably the most realistic way to combo with Halo Fountain in Limited. You can pay double white, tap it, and untap two tapped creatures you control to draw a card. And uh, I don't even know if I should bother reading the last ability, but if you can pay five white mana, tap it, and untap 15 tapped creatures you control, you win the game. If that happens... Uh, congratulations, but uh, you should probably already have won the game at that point. So, yeah, the last ability is more flavor text. If you can build around it with a few vehicles, then this might become playable, otherwise I would probably avoid it. So not the type of card you probably want to first pick and build around, but rather a card that if you get it late and you already had a couple playable vehicles in your deck, then sure, you might want to give it a try. Also gets better if you have some flying creatures that can reliably attack and uh, be tapped without necessarily running it into opposing creatures. So a difficult card to evaluate for sure, but I'm starting out with kind of a conservative C for Halo Fountain. 
I would not overrate it, but definitely has potential under the right circumstances. Then we have Holt for Ransom, one of the more flavorful cards in this set. A 2-mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting a creature, and it's probably going to be enchanting an opposing creature, which cannot attack or block, and has an ability for 7 mana, in which case Holt for Ransom's controller sacrifices it and draws a card. Can only be used as a sorcery. So we're paying 2 mana for Hold for Ransom, essentially a pacifism, until the opponent pays 7 mana to get rid of our Hold for Ransom, although we do get a card in return. So we spent 2 mana on it, whereas the opponent is spending 7 mana on it, and we get our card back so we didn't lose out on any card advantage. The major drawback is if the opponent can somehow sacrifice their creature, maybe to the casualty mechanic, then uh, they don't necessarily have to pay the 7 mana to still get value from their creature. And uh, of course casualty, one of the 5 main mechanics in the set, so a lot of decks will uh, have a few of these in their deck. So I still like Hold for Ransom, uh, I think C plus seems fine, a card I'm gonna probably play in most white decks if you're playing best of 3 and the opponent has a ton of casualty cards in their deck then I would maybe think about sideboarding this out, but uh, overall seems like a solid role player in any white deck. Next we have Illuminator Virtuoso, 2 mana 1-1 one, one human rogue at uncommon with double strike, and when a Virtuoso becomes the target of a spell you control, it connives. So we get to loot and potentially put a counter on it. Now a 2 mana 1-1 one, one double strike already you know, pretty reasonable, especially if you can combine it with any equipment or other ways to increase its power and toughness, but it has that built-in connive uh, ability to put plus one counters on it, in which case it can get out of hand pretty quickly. So yeah, Virtuoso, if you have a few pump spells, we'll see in red there's a pump spell for two mana that gives four additional power, means you can potentially deal ten damage out of nowhere. That's where it's going to be at its best. But even without any crazy pump spells, still definitely an above average to drop. So C plus for Virtuoso. Our next card is Inspiring Overseer, 3 mana, 2 1 Angel Cleric at common. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield, we gain one life and draw a card. Wow, and this card is amazing. It's very similar to the uh, 3 drop from the Dungeons and Dragons expansion, except it's also an angel and it also flies. So a massive upgrade stapled onto a card that was already very good. And uh, yeah, there's a couple small angel synergies in the set, like we've seen with Jada, but it's not like the Overseer needs any help. Three mana, two one flyer draws a card. Just amazing. Probably the best white common in the sets, if I had to guess gets a B. Kill shot, a reprint, 3 mana, instant, at common, destroying target attacking, creature. So in a more defensive deck where you're expecting the opponent to be the one turning their creatures sideways, it's not a bad removal spell, still a bit conditional in nature, sometimes you're the one that wants to be attacking, maybe the opponent has a bomb in play that they're not attacking with. In those scenarios, skill shots doesn't look all that great, but uh, probably a card you're happy to have one copy of in your more defensive white decks, thinking of kind of the Brokers family. So gets a C. A knockout blow, 3 mana, uncommon instant, costs 2 generic mana, less to cast if it targets a red creature, and then it deals 4 damage to an attacking or blocking creature, and you gain 2 life. So. It's easy to make comparisons to kill shot. This also works on blocking creatures. It doesn't destroy, but only deals 4 damage, and it also gains 2 life, but has a massive upside when playing against red creatures, only costing a single white mana. And as we'll see, there's an entire cycle of these uncommons that uh, become better when playing against certain colors, so definitely powerful sideboard cards for constructed. As far as limited goes, knockout blow is not bad, even 
when not playing against red creatures, it's kind of a... I wouldn't say a strictly worse version of kill shot, it's just kind of different. But uh, especially in a set where a lot of decks are three colors, you're more likely to end up facing a red creature. So I think that should also be taken into account when evaluating this. Because if we can cast it for a single white, this card is quite good. It goes up in value if you're playing best of three as opposed to best of one, where you can maybe put this in the sideboard and then only play against red decks. In best of one, maybe closer to a C. In best of three, probably closer to a C plus for a knockout blow. So I guess C plus here, kind of depending on the format. Mage's Attendant, a three mana, three two, cat rogue at uncommon. And when it enters a battlefield, create a 1 1 blue wizard creature token. And we can pay one mana, sacrifice that creature to counter target non creature spell unless its controller pays one mana. So we're getting. 4 power, 3 toughness, split across 2 bodies. So this will probably be at its best in the Cabaretti decks, where you want to make lots of creature tokens and kind of go wide. And uh, yeah, that ability to potentially counter spells, you're rarely going to actually counter anything with it, but it's going to force the opponent to kind of play a turn behind to make sure their spells don't get countered. So kind of difficult to judge how good it's being when in play, because you don't really notice it unless you're on the other side of the battlefield. Overall, still a pretty good card uh, with, you know, reasonable stats. So probably playing it in almost every white deck, so C+. Also for Constructed, it's true it makes two different uh, creatures for your party, so could have some Constructed applications, who knows. Next we have Mysterious Limousine, a 5 mana 4-4 four, four vehicle at rare. Crew cost is 2. And when the Limousine enters a battlefield or attacks, exile up to one author target creature until the Limousine leaves the battlefield. And if a creature is put into exile this way, return each author card exiled with a Limousine to the battlefield under its owner's control. So if one creature steps into the Limousine, another creature has to step out, basically. It's a pretty flavorful card. How does it play out in Limited is a question. You don't have to exile cards with it if you don't want to. So it can potentially come down, exile the opponent's best card, and then kind of sit on the battlefield as an artifact, and then only attack if the coast is clear to get in for four. Crew cost isn't incredibly high. Yeah, this card has potential, um, especially if the opponent doesn't have any way to remove artifacts. Limousine, I think it's a B. Kind of a tricky card. Um, could technically even exile your own creatures with it if you have some sweet enter the battlefield abilities you can re-trigger. And could also work well with blitz creatures. Since you can blitz them, exile them, and then when they come back they no longer need to be sacrificed. So yeah, I guess it also has some cool synergies. So I think starting out at a B is fair, but... Uh, yeah, I could see this doing quite a bit of work. Next is Patch Up, 3 mana Uncommon Sorcery, returning up to 3 target creature cards with total mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, pretty interesting reanimation effect. There's not that many decks that necessarily want an effect like this. Uh, probably going to be at its best in kind of the Obscura, uh, family where blue black cares about filling the graveyard and then patch up could be a way to get a bunch of creatures back. It's not like there's a ton of one drops necessarily, so maybe looking to get back a three drop or a two drop and a one drop. So probably more of a card for constructed than for limited. Uh, since I'm not all that excited about this, I'll give it a D. A Rabble Rousing, 5 mana, rare enchantment, and this is our first instance of Hideaway, a returning mechanic. So Hideaway 5 means when this enters a battlefield, we can look at the top 5 cards of our library, exiling one of them face down, and then the rest on the bottom in a random order. And then later, most cards with Hideaway will have a way for you to cast the card that you exiled for free, Although the condition that has to be met can be kind of tricky. 
In this case, whenever we attack with one or more creatures, create that many 1-1 green and white citizen creature tokens, then if you control 10 or more creatures, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So even if the card is a sorcery, you can still play it at instant speed, basically. Uh, same with creatures. In a deck with a whole bunch of tokens, you can basically attack with the tokens unopposed, because they're going to get replaced by additional tokens anyway that can play defense, so there's no reason not to attack. Let's say you have 5 one, one tokens, they all attack, get replaced by 5 additional tokens, and at some points, even before blocks, you're controlling 10 creatures, so you can cast the Hideaway card for free. Not all that difficult to actually get uh, the value from Hideaway. And uh, yeah, if you've got some expensive cards in your deck, that could provide a ton of value. And even without Hideaway, just making additional tokens here and there could be pretty strong. And it's going to force the opponent to leave back a ton of blockers so you don't get too many 1-1s in play for free. So... It's a card that requires a little bit of setup. If you don't have any creatures in play, of course, it doesn't do anything. But uh, should be quite powerful, especially in your Cabaretti decks. So I'll give it a B. Next we have Rafine's Guidance, a 1-man enchantment aura at common, giving the enchanted creature plus 1 plus 1. And we can cast it from our graveyard by paying 3 mana rather than its mana cost. Okay, so it's kind of a recursive enchantment kind of failing to see where I would want Guidance in my uh, limited decks. It's like an okay card, maybe if you manage to draft a weird two-color aggro deck somehow. Um, but I don't expect that to be the case very often. Maybe okay in a Cabaretti deck to pump up some of your smaller tokens, but even there I would probably rather have an equipment. So Guidance gets a D. Next we have Rafine's Informant, 2 mana, 2-1 two human wizard at common, and when it enters a battlefield, it connives. So it has the potential of being a 2 mana 3-2, which also lets you draw and discard, giving you a bit of card selection. Yeah, there's quite a bit to like about this 2-drop, uh, even in a late game. can still be useful, discarding a land to maybe draw into something more useful. So, good early, good late, it's a 2-drop that fills your curve, which is still important, even in these crazy 3 or 4 color decks. It seems like a C+, plus. a 2-drop that's not a dead card in late game, is uh, definitely a worthy candidate. Refuse to yield, 2 mana, uncommon instant, giving a creature plus 2, plus 7 until end of turn, and we get to untap it. Don't think there are any synergies in the set that let you like deal damage with toughness rather than power. So that's not what we're necessarily looking for. But uh, yeah, it's just a solid combo trick. It untaps, which is very important. And it gives both additional power and toughness. So should let most trades go in your favor now. And uh, by untapping can also be a nice surprise. So as far as combat tricks go, this is a very solid one and gets a C, which is my usual grade for, you know, good combat tricks. Revelation of Power, 2 mana, instant at common, giving a creature plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. And if it has a counter on it, it also gains flying and lifelink until end of turn. This combat trick I'm less excited about, since... It's not like we can expect all our creatures to have counters on them. Um, so I think this is definitely a weaker comma trick than the previous one. Could still be okay in more aggressive decks that, that might have some shield counters or plus one counters floating around. But two mana, if it's only giving plus two plus two, is definitely more than what we would want to pay for it. So somewhere between a, a C and a D. I'll start out with a lower grade here for Revelation of Power. Rumor Gatherer is a 3-mana 2-1 Elf Wizard at Uncommon with Alliance saying we get to scry one and if, it's, and if this is the second time the ability has resolved this turn we get to draw a card instead. 
So that's pretty nice if we play a token maker. So two creatures and one card, we get to scry one and draw a card. So if we can repeat that a few times, we're going to bury the opponent in card selection and card advantage. So definitely wants to go in your Cabaretti decks. Otherwise it can be a little tricky to play two creatures in the same turn if you're trying to curve out. So a 2 one for 3 also much smaller than you would like. So it's the type of card that you're taking on a bit of risk by playing it, but the payoff is certainly there if you can string together some card draw. And then it can hopefully help you take over the game. So C plus for Rumor Gatherer, a card with a ton of potential, but uh, just make sure you've got enough token makers to go with it. Sanctuary Warden, 6 mana, 5-5 five, five, Angel Soldier at Mythic. It flies, and it enters the battlefield with 2 shield counters on it. Okay, so we're getting a huge flyer with built-in protection, but there's more. When Sanctuary Warden enters the battlefield or attacks, you may remove a counter from any creature you or, creature or planeswalker you control. And if you do, draw a card and create a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token. So let's ignore the planeswalker part for a brief moment. So we can play the Warden. Let's say we don't have any other counters in play. We can still remove a shield counter from the Warden itself. So in that case, it's a 6 mana, 5-5 five, five flyer. Enters with one leftover shield counter, makes a 1-1 one, one citizen and draws a card. And then you still have a ton of additional upside later if you have additional counters to remove to make more citizens draw more cards, or you can make sure to keep a shield counter on the Warden so it's protected from most removal spells. So yeah, this card is amazing and definitely deserving of an S, a card that has the potential to stabilize a board where you're behind, pull you ahead if... Uh, you're at parity and take over the game by drawing cards, making tokens, and has that built-in protection, so even if the opponent has a removal spell lined up, it may not necessarily answer the Sanctuary Warden. So, yeah, this seems like one of the best cards for limited. Sky Crier is a 2-mana 1-1 one, one bird citizen at common, so once again, keep that citizen creature type in mind. Has flying and lifelink. And for 4 mana, both players draw a card. Not necessarily a huge advantage when we're paying 4 mana for it. So let's ignore the ability for a second. 2 mana 1-1 one, one flyer that has lifelink. Yeah, that can be pretty annoying for the opponent to deal with. Like, it's essentially a 2 point life swing each turn. And maybe you've got some cards to combo with it. Thinking of... A uh, Rigo Streetwise Mentor, maybe drawing a card with it. So those are the types of combos I'm looking for. Without any other synergies or ways to maybe increase its power, which of course also plays well with Flying and Lifelink, I'm less excited about it. But if we have a few ways to enhance the Sky Crier, then I could see it being pretty good. So overall, probably still conservative C for Sky Crier but just be on the lookout for more synergies, and then it will go up in value. Speak Easy Server is a 5-mana 3-3 bird citizen. At common, it flies, and when it enters, you gain one life for each author creature you control. So, probably at its best in Cabaretti, where you can gain a ton of life with it, and then gives you a flying creature to deal with opposing flyers. Maybe get some attacks in if the ground is stalled. Now, not the best stats necessarily, 5 mana for a 3-3 three, three flyer, but if you can gain, let's say, 4-5 life, then uh, it becomes much more appealing. So overall, probably C for the server. Swooping Protector, 4 mana, 2-1 Bird Citizen at Uncommon has Flash and Flying, and enters the battlefield with a shield counter on it. Okay, so has that built-in protection. Flash and shield counters also play well together, as you can now potentially ambush a 2-toughness creature from the opponent, and then still have your 
flyer left over. Plays well with author instance and maybe counter spells. Um, and then, you know, can play defense if needed. If it still has that shield counter, otherwise can start applying pressure. Now four mana is pretty expensive for only two power of flying power. But that being said, flying creatures are also probably where you would want to have uh, the shield counter. Because if the ground is stalled and you have a flyer out, the opponent finally top decks a removal spell. But now your flyer also has a shield counter. Their removal doesn't necessarily answer it. So, you know, a flying creature is probably where I would want to put my shield counter to begin with. So, it's a pretty good card if you're on a stable board. Maybe not the best if you're behind, as it only has two power. So, can give it an incredibly high grade, but I think it's still playable at the very least. So, we'll give it a C. All Seeing Arbiter. 6 mana, 5-4, Mythic Rare Avatar with flying. When it enters the battlefield or attacks, draw 2 cards and then discard a card. And whenever you discard a card, target creature and opponent controls gets minus X minus O until, under, until your next turn, where X is the number of different mana values among cards in your graveyard. Okay, so we're starting out strong here. So this enters already, you're up a card. And then, uh, yeah, if it can keep attacking, it provides more card advantage, kind of controls the opponent's board, thanks to the minus X minus O ability, and plays well with the other, I guess, blue-black cards that fill your graveyard. But even by itself, it uh, can kind of enable itself as well. So it's not like it needs any additional help. Now, it doesn't have any, you know, built-in protection, so... A lot of the bigger removal spells can deal with the Arbiter and uh, you're only really up one card in the exchange. But if the opponent doesn't have an immediate answer, this will not only kill the opponent quickly, but do all sorts of other powerful things. So I'm hesitant to give it an S, but certainly one of the higher A level grades so far. Backstreet Bruiser, 2 mana, 3-3. Three, three. Cephalid Rogue at common has Defender, and as long as there are two or more counters among creatures you control, the Bruiser can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So yeah, nice early blocker for those more slow and dirty Brokers or maybe Maestros decks. I guess Obscura can also be quite controlling. So it fits into a lot of the different blue archetypes, and especially in the Brokers with shield counters and I guess the Obscura with Connive providing plus one counters. You should be able to turn the Bruiser into a three powered attacker. Pretty solid for a two drop. If your deck is kind of more slanted towards wanting to apply pressure, then you probably don't want a three three defender. But uh, I think most blue decks are gonna end up on the more defensive end of the spectrum. So somewhere between a C and a C plus, we'll start out with C for Backstreet Bruiser. Brokers a Veteran, 2 mana, 2-1 two Human Soldier at common. When the Veteran dies, put a shield counter on a target creature you control. Okay, so one thing we haven't seen a whole lot of so far is creatures that you're happy to sacrifice. And uh, given that there's a whole family that cares about casualty and sacrificing creatures, pretty important that there are a few cheap creatures you don't mind getting rid of. And the veteran is a perfect example, as it leaves behind a shield counter when it dies. So a creature you ha you're happy to either trade off or sacrifice. And uh, yeah, that might make it one of the better blue two drops at common. Don't know if it goes all the way to a C plus. I doubt it, but certainly a worthy C. And those sacrifice decks will uh, take it highly. Case the joint four mana instant at common draws two cards, 
and then we get to look at the top card of each player's library as a bonus. Find card draw spell, play as well alongside other flash creatures and counter spells. And uh, if you can maybe set up your defenses early by playing some high toughness creatures or blockers, then uh, you can draw cards without being, being under too much pressure. So case of joint gets a C. Not one of the best card draw spells we've seen recently, but uh, still quite playable. Cut Your Losses is a 6 mana rare sorcery with casualty 2. So as we cast it, we may sacrifice a creature with power 2 or greater. And if we do, we get to copy it and potentially choose new targets for the copy. And in this case, target player mills half their library rounded down. So we have to do some quick math to figure out if this is playable or not. So 6 mana... How many cards is the opponent going to have left? So they start with 40, opening hand of 7. Let's say maybe 7 turns go by before we get to 6 lands in play, assuming we maybe missed a land drop. So now we maybe have around 27, 26 cards left in library. So if we mill half, 13. If we mill half twice, then we're looking at maybe like six or seven cards remaining in library six mana sacrifice a two-powered creature basically have the opponent with six cards left in their deck puts them on a six turn timer to kill you otherwise they're gonna lose the game by drawing a card from an empty library so yeah we have to jump through a few hoops but if you can play this in a deck with a lot of good defensive cards cards like the 3-3 Defender we saw earlier, then this could be a legitimate win condition. Just play this, sacrifice a creature, and wait six turns to win the game. So, definitely a card with a lot of potential. Not a card every deck is going to be interested in. So this kind of a weird build around in a way. I want to play this alongside those good defensive creatures and maybe some card draw so you can find this more reliably. Because if your deck is just all, you know, defensive creatures without anything to attack with, you might have to wait a while before you actually draw this rare to win the game. Yeah, definitely a tricky card to evaluate, but I think it has enough uh, potential that I'm willing to give it a relatively high grade, which is B. Not too many other mill cards to support it. It's mostly self-mill, so yeah, it's usually going to be a card you play and then you'll still have to wait a while to actually uh, mill the opponent out. Next is Disdainful Stroke, a reprint, two mana instance, at common, counters target spell with mana value four or greater. I think this card's going to be pretty good in this set because we're playing three color cards. Formats tends to be a little slower than your average limited set which means maybe mana costs are also slightly higher. And then two mana to counter the opponent's bomb seems pretty decent. So I think I'm willing to go up to a C plus for Disdainful Stroke. Now, not a card you necessarily want to play two or three copies of in each deck, but certainly the first copy I think is quite valuable in most blue decks. And then whether you play a second is going to be up for debate. Echo Inspector, 4 mana, 2-3, Bird Rogue at common. It flies, and when it enters, it connives. So it has a potential of being a 3-4 flyer for 4. That's pretty good. And uh, yeah, it's a common, so you can expect to get this pretty often. Can maybe fill your graveyard for additional uh, synergies that require different mana values in the graveyard. And has a counter for cards that care about you have encounters on some of your creatures. So I think the inspector has enough going for it that I'm okay with a C plus for it. A large flyer can also close out the game pretty quickly. Next we have Arendt Street Artist, a one mana human rogue at rare. And uh, it's legendary, has flash, defender and haste as an O3. 
And for two mana we can tap it to copy target spell you control that wasn't cast. And you may choose a new target for the copy. It's a pretty strange card. Takes a while to parse what's going on with it. But I think what we're meant to do with it is copy one of our casualty cards. So we play our spell with casualty, sacrifice a creature, get a copy, and then we can copy the copy with Street Artist. Now, this does require quite a bit of setup. We need a creature to sacrifice. We need two leftover mana, in addition to casting the spell with casualty. So it's not going to be easy to set up. And in the meantime, it's an O3 blocker that doesn't really do much. Uh, the fact that it has flash is kind of cute, I guess. But yeah, on a one drop, not all that relevant. Going to give it a D, but I could see a rare circumstance where you have a deck with a ton of casualty where it could be worth it. Next we have Even the Score, a mythic rare instant for X and triple blue, letting you draw X cards, and has additional upside, cost triple blue less to cast if an opponent has drawn four or more cards this turn. Unlikely to happen in limited, so we're mostly evaluating this as kind of a, a blue sun's zenith that doesn't shuffle back into your deck, which is still pretty good, especially in a more defensive controlling deck that can stall out the game and then cast this for x equals maybe four or more and should completely take over the game from there. Not a card you want to be playing early, but uh, assuming the format is slow enough, I could see this being a pretty powerful way to kind of break the, uh, the board stall and uh, carry you to victory. So B for even the score. Expendable Lackey, a 1-mana, 1-1 one one human citizen at common. You can pay 2 mana and exile it from your graveyard to create a 1-1 one one blue fish creature token that cannot be blocked, can only be activated as a sorcery. So this is what I'm talking about, a cheap creature that we don't mind sacrificing and can still provide value once it's in the graveyard. Also good if we can mill it somehow. So it, it kind of plays well across multiple archetypes. So that's going to be especially the Obscura and the Maestros Obscura because we're maybe more likely to have um, ways to put stuff into our graveyard. Although I guess it's mostly just blue-black. And then uh, Maestros both has ways to fill the graveyard as well as the highest density of casualty cards that require a sacrifice. And uh, yeah, the unblockable fish can certainly add up if you can make a few of those. So I think Lackey seems pretty innocuous, but might be one of the better blue commons. Gets a C+. Next we have Fairy Vandal. Two mana, one two Fairy Rogue at uncommon. And it has Flash and Flying. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on Fairy Vandal. So reprint from Throne of Eldraine. Uh, this set has quite a few cards to enable it. Mostly Connive is a way to draw extra cards to put extra counters on Fairy Vandal. And uh, yeah, the plus one counter that the Vandal accumulates could also synergize with some of the other cards we've already seen. So, yeah, there's a lot to like about it. Should slot into most blue decks without too much effort. Gets a C+. Hypnotic Grifter, a 1-mana, one 1-2 one human rogue at uncommon. And for 3-mana, it connives. It's a pretty decent mana sink in the late game. A little bit pricey to activate, but uh, if the board is stalled and there's nothing else going on, Getting to draw and discard a few times and then picking a plus one counters in the process could be pretty neat. Although I imagine once you get to that stage, you're mostly going to be discarding lands. So Hypnotic Grifter, a little slow to get going, uh, not that impressive early. But uh, yeah, could certainly be useful in decks with more connive slash discard synergy. So I'll give it a C. A Ledger Shredder, a 2-mana 1-3 Bird Advisor at rare. It flies 
and whenever any player casts their second spell each turn, the Shredder connives. If the opponent casts two spells, we get to connive. We get to connive if we maybe play Shredder, followed by another cheap creature. So it's not that difficult to connive a few times per turn cycle. And uh, on a flyer that's already relatively efficiently costed, that can uh, add up quite quickly. So Shredder seems quite strong, at the very least a B. Then we have a little chat, a 2 mana instant at uncommon with casualty 1. So very cheap to copy a little chat, can maybe sacrifice that blue 1 drop we saw earlier, and then we can copy it. And then we can look at the top 2 cards of our library, putting one of them into our hand and the other on the bottom of our library. So just a nice bit of card selection. Without casualty, not that exciting. With casualty, assuming we have a 1 drop or some other one-powered creature we don't mind sacrificing, then it becomes a lot more exciting. So, kind of depends how your deck is set up. Gonna be at its best in the Maestro's family-themed decks, of course. It is potentially just two mana to draw two cards in the top four. So, that's quite a bit of card selection. So maybe it is worth it to uh, give it a C+. Next we have Majestic Metamorphosis, a 3 mana instant at common, saying until end of turn, target artifact or creature becomes a 4-4 angel artifact creature and gains flying. And we get to draw a card as well. Okay, so there's quite a bit going on. Um, similar to one of the cards from Kamigawa that ended up kind of overperforming in my opinion. And this is quite similar, turning maybe one of your smaller creatures into a 4-4, which can ambush an opposing creature, flying also a nice upside, so it can also maybe help you deal those last points of damage, turning one of your ground creatures into a 4-4 angel, and then draw a card is what makes this card so great. Without drawing a card, this is pretty unexciting, but by replacing itself, you're uh, not really giving up a whole lot. So yeah, I like Metamorphosis a lot. Now, of course, the context of this set might be a little bit different. We don't have like those cheap ninjutsu creatures that we had in Kamigawa to combo with it. So that does potentially also change how it plays out. But at a base level, certainly a card with potential. So I'll start out with a C, but could be one of those cards that also ends up as a, a C plus instead. Make Disappear, 2 mana instant, at common with casualty 1, and says counter target spell unless its controller pays 2 generic mana. So kind of a quench with upside. Um, now I don't expect to sacrifice a creature to this very often, but maybe if the opponent is playing a bomb and they can pay the 2 mana, it's going to be worth it to sacrifice and make sure they cannot resolve their spell. Not a card I'm excited about, would much rather have like a Disdainful Stroke, so don't expect to play this very often, but should still be playable since there are quite a few flash cards and other instants to play alongside it. That kind of playing this draw-go uh, gameplay should be feasible. Obscura Initiate, a 3 mana 2-2 two -two bird citizen at common, so once again, a citizen, important creature type. So it's a flyer, and for one and a hybrid black or white, it gains a lifelink until end of turn. So it's going to make it pretty tricky for the opponent to race, is if you can keep activating this and connecting a four-point life swing. And uh, yeah, not that expensive or difficult to activate in most decks. So C plus for Obscura Initiate. An offer you can't refuse, a 1 mana uncommon instant saying counter target non-creature spell and its controller creates two treasure tokens. So it's a negate for only 1 mana, but the opponent gets two treasure tokens. And in this set, giving the opponent two treasures seems borderline suicidal. Now there will be scenarios where it's going to be easier to keep up one mana as opposed to two for negate. Maybe you have a bomb you want to play and you want to make sure you can protect it. 
then I could see this being okay, especially once you're already in the late game and giving the opponent two treasures isn't all that relevant. But if you're casting this anywhere before turn six, giving the opponent two treasures seems like an easy way to lose the game. So I can't really recommend running this, but it's also not completely unplayable. So I think this falls somewhere in the, the D category. A card that, yeah, under the right circumstances I could see playing, but as a baseline is probably best left in the sideboard. Out of the way is a 4 mana instant, and uncommon costs 2 generic mana less to cast if it targets a green permanent, and then returns target a non-land permanent an opponent controls to its owner's hand, and we get to draw a card. So kind of like a kicked into the royal, with the additional upside of potentially only costing 2 mana when targeting green permanents, part of that uh, cycle of uncommon kind of uh, hate cards, if you will. And yeah, this one seems okay. 4 mana may be a little expensive for a bounce spell, but we're getting a card in return. And uh, especially if we can get the discount, it's going to be great. And in a format full of 3 color decks, it's going to be quite common for us to play against uh, green creatures. So it's going to be even more likely that uh, we get that discount to begin with. So I think I've talked myself into giving this a, a C+, a card that I'm probably going to include in the main deck most of the time, but especially if you're playing best of three, then uh, potentially keeping this in the sideboard and then bringing it in in the uh, appropriate matchups makes it even more uh, of a, a desirable card. Next is Psionic Snoop, 3 mana 03, human rogue at common, has flash, and when the Snoop enters the battlefield, it connives. So it has the potential of being a 1-4 flash creature to maybe ambush an opposing creature from the opponent, and potentially plays well alongside other instants and counter spells. Still not a card I'm excited about, but seems playable enough if you're playing a lot of other instants, so it gets a C. Psychic Pickpocket, a 5 mana, Cephalid Rogue at Uncommon is a 3-2, and when it enters the battlefield it connives. And when it connives this way, return up to 1, target a non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Uh, so it's kind of like your uh, mana war, although we're paying 5 mana for it as opposed to 3, but we're getting a slightly bigger creature and getting to connive as well. So potentially like a 4-3 that bounces something for 5 mana. Not bad. Uh, bouncing also a little bit more relevant in a set with a lot of creature tokens and maybe shield counters that might be distributed. So I think a C plus for the pickpocket. Public enemy, a 3 mana enchantment aura at uncommon, enchanting a creature. And then all creatures attack the enchanted creature's controller each combat if able. And when the enchanted creature dies, draw a card. So this is a pretty unusual card. It's forcing the opponents to attack you if you put this on your own creature, which is probably the most likely scenario. And then when your creature dies, we still replace it with an extra card, so it's not like we're really down on the card advantage here. So this is going to be at its best in like a, a deck that can present a lot of blockers that also have a little bit of power. So if the opponent can't remove the creature that's public enemy, they'll uh, be forced to attack into your wall of creatures and you can slowly pick off the opponent's army one by one by maybe setting up some favorable blocks. So a card with potential. Now still requires kind of the right circumstances for it to be good. If you're desperately behind on board, then it's not really doing anything. And, uh, you know, if the opponent doesn't have a ton of creatures in play, or if they can remove your creature, maybe even in response of you playing this, it's pretty risky. Uh, and uh, bound spells can also punish this. So there's definitely scenarios where public enemy is going to be a liability. But overall, I think it has enough potential to be at least a card worth considering in your blue decks. Gets a C. 
Then a Reservoir Kraken, a 4 mana 6 6, six, six rare with Trample and Ward 2. And at the beginning of each combat, if the Kraken is untapped, any opponent may tap an untapped creature they control. If they do, then we tap the Kraken and make a 1 1 unblockable fish creature token. Yeah, this card can uh, quickly add up. If the opponent wants to keep it tapped, which I mean, they probably do, as a 6 6 trampler for 4 doesn't mess around, then uh, we slowly accumulate an army of unblockable fish, which we can use on offense or on defense if we otherwise needed the Kraken. Now, historically speaking, cards that give the opponent choices like this are worse than they may appear at first glance, because the opponent's going to make the best decision for them, whether that's, you know, tapping the Kraken or not. So, you know, whatever you think this card is worth, maybe go down a little bit, but it's still pretty good. Um and can be quite punishing for decks that maybe have a, a lower creature count and won't be able to tap it down reliably. And uh, there's some other neat combos kind of sprinkled throughout the set that play well with a Reservoir Kraken, so... Overall, pretty happy giving this a high grade. And uh, I think I might even go all the way up to an A bomb level card. Possible I might be overrating this slightly and I should follow my own advice and give it a B, but uh, I'm optimistic. Rooftop Nuisance is a 3 mana sorcery at common with casualty 1 saying tap target creature. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step and then draw a card. So pretty easy to copy this, just casualty 1. And then it could be 3 mana, keep 2 creatures locked down, and draw 2 cards. That seems like a pretty powerful tool. Now it is a sorcery, so it's not like we can use this beginning of combat, which is when this type of effect would be at its most uh, kind of efficient, because we could keep a creature tap down for much longer. So yeah, being a sorcery does definitely hurt this card's potential. Uh, I think I'm still probably fine giving it a C. Uh, gets better the more aggressive your deck is. Whereas if it were an instant, it would be much better in the, the more controlling strategies. A run out of town, a 4 mana instant at common, saying the owner of target a non-land permanent puts it on the top or bottom of their library. An effect we've seen many times before. This one doesn't have any particular upside. So it's a fine card. It's not really putting you down on card advantage because either it gets rid of a permanent for a long time or the opponent has to redraw it. So it's kind of like stealing the opponent's next draw step, if you will. A decent card if you're kind of struggling for removal, but probably wouldn't be my first choice. So gets a C. And then Security Bypass was my preview card for the set, a 2-mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting a creature. As long as the enchanted creature is attacking alone, it cannot be blocked. And the enchanted creature has, when this deals damage to a player, combat damage I should add, it connives. So yeah, could definitely add up quickly, especially when paired with maybe a lifelink creature or uh, let alone like a double strike creature then uh, this could end the game in a couple attacks. It gives you quite a bit of additional card selection, and uh, hopefully the opponent doesn't have an answer at the ready, or you can maybe put this on a creature with a shield counter on it, and then uh, you can also attack with it without fearing a, uh, a clean answer from the opponent. So, yeah, bypass, card with potential, also some inherent risks, as you have with most auras, but... Uh, I think a C is probably fine. Sewer Crocodile, a 6 mana 4 6 crocodile at common, and for 4 mana it cannot be blocked this turn, and we get a 3 mana discount on the ability if there are 5 or more mana values among cards in your graveyard. Pretty expensive, 6 mana, and we're not getting a whole lot of power and toughness in return. Um, the ability, you know, can be a nice way to close out the game but also going to be tricky to get the discount. 
and at four mana, kind of expensive. So if you're really lacking kind of a curve topper to close out the game, Crocodile will do, but also wouldn't be my uh, first choice. So I think D for Crocodile, but we have to also recognize situations where we might actually want it. Sleep with the Fishes, a 4-mana enchantment aura at Uncommon. Enchanting an opposing creature, keeping it tapped down and tapping it in the first place, and we get to make a 1-1 unblockable fish in the process. So nice upgrade over your typical sleep paralysis, being able to make that uh, fish token. So yeah, pretty excited about sleep with the fishes. Has a couple potential drawbacks. If the opponent can sacrifice their creature, then uh, it's not gonna be as effective as we would like it to be. But we still get to make a fish token in the process, so... B for sleep with the fishes. Slip out the back a one mana instant at uncommon, saying put a plus one plus one counter on target creature and it phases out. So it doesn't lose the plus one counter by phasing out, which is nice. Can maybe save it from removal. And uh, yeah, it's not really the best as a combo trick because it phases out, but we could technically like chum block with one of our creatures phase it out and then it sticks around while we got to prevent some damage assuming no trample so you know has a couple different applications probably going to be interested in this if we have a lot of powerful creatures worth protecting uh, which is not going to be the case for every deck but uh, yeah still a playable combo trick so we'll give it a c and then Undercover Operative, a 4-mana rare Shapeshifter Rogue. And it's essentially a clone, so enters the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, but has a little bit of upside. If it enters as a copy of one of our creatures, it gets a shield counter as well. Now clones, probably copying opposing creatures more often than not, just given how games naturally play out. But uh, yeah, it's just additional upside on top of a clone effect. Clone effects used to be very good back in the day. They've kind of slowly gotten worse over time, I think, in Limited, but still pretty okay since if the opponent controls the best creature, you just copy theirs, and then hopefully these can kind of keep each other at bay. And if you happen to have the best creature on the battlefield, then Operative is probably gonna secure the game for you. So B for Operative. Then we've got a Wing Shield Agent, a 3-mana 2-3 Human Soldier at Uncommon. When the Agent enters a battlefield, it enters with a Shield counter on it, and when it attacks, up to one other target creature gains Flying until end of turn. Now the Agent doesn't have Flying by itself, which is unfortunate. So you're kind of getting one free attack, and then... You know, the next time the agent probably doesn't have a shield counter anymore, so it's not going to be able to keep giving your creatures flying for very long. Not super high on wing shield agents, but then again, it's still a 2-3 creature with a shield counter for 3 mana. So, in that sense, you're still getting a good amount of stats. Better probably in a defensive deck where you can set up those double blocks with a shield counter as opposed to making full use of its flying ability, which is maybe a little counterintuitive. So somewhere between a C and a C+. I'll start it out a little bit lower, just give it a C, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. Then we have Wiretapping, a 5-mana rare enchantment with Hideaway 5, and then whenever we draw our first card during each of our draw steps, we get to draw a card, so get to draw two cards per turn, and then if we somehow get to nine or more cards in hand, we get to enable the hideaway. So we need to have seven cards in hand, untap, take or draw a step, draw the extra card from wiretapping, and now we have nine cards in hand, and we're good to go. So unlikely to get that to that point. So we're mostly evaluating this as five mana for your personal howling mine, drawing an extra card each turn which admittedly is still pretty good in a format that is gearing up to be kind of slow and grindy. So there's still a lot to like about this, 
there are quite a few kind of incidental disenchant effects in the set that uh, you'll have to keep in mind. But overall, probably still a B. Not a card that helps you impact the board, but if there's any sort of board stall, this will help you take over. Then we have Witness Protection, another very flavorful card. A one mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting a creature, making it lose all its abilities and turn it into a green and white citizen creature with base power and toughness 1 1, and named Legitimate Business Person. So it's kind of a frogify effect for only one mana, which is something we haven't really seen before. Solid removal spell for blue especially, that doesn't get the best removal, uh, although also comes with the, the same drawbacks as we mentioned earlier of opponent potentially being able to sacrifice their creature and still get some value. So, you know, it's not a perfect one mana removal spell, but that's probably for the best. Still, overall, I think a card I'm happy to have in uh, most of my blue decks. Probably doesn't quite make it to C+, because Frogify effects still have their limitations, but I think a C for Witness Protection, since it is quite uh, cheap to play, although I could see this potentially uh, kind of bumping up to a C+, if it performs but we'll start out more conservative here. First black card is Angel of Suffering, 5 mana, 5-3, five, a Nightmare Angel at Mythic, and as most angels it flies, saying if damage would be dealt to you, prevent the damage and mill twice that many cards. It's an interesting ability, might even have some synergy with cards that require you to have 5 or more mana values in Graveyard, which is mostly a blue-black thing, potentially gives you kind of a second lease on life. If you're starting to get low, maybe you've got like five or less life left, play Angel of Suffering. Now, if the opponent is trying to race, they have to go through the rest of your library instead of maybe a couple points of life instead. And uh, that can help you win a race. A five-powered flyer can also end the game pretty quickly. If you play this when you're at like 20 life, then the opponent might have an easier time milling you as opposed to dealing damage by going after your life total. So could also lead to situations where you're maybe better off waiting to play this until a little bit later. So it's a bit of an awkward card to play with and play against, but uh, a card with potential. So we'll give it a B. Gets better if you have more synergies with having a lot of cards in Graveyard. Body Launderer, 4 mana, Mythic Rare, Ogre Rogue. It's a 3-3 with Death Touch, saying whenever another non-token creature you control dies, the Launderer connives. And when the Launderer dies, return another target non-rogue creature card with equal or lesser power from your graveyard to the battlefield. So if the Launderer connives a few times, it can pick up plus one counters, increasing its power, so the last ability also gets a little bit better. So, yeah, there's a lot to like about this. A 3-3 Death Touch for 4, already reasonable stats. And uh, especially in kind of an Obscura deck, or maybe a Riveteer's deck, where creatures tend to be sacrificed quite often, then um, it can provide a good bit of value. Now, am I willing to go all the way up to an A for this? I don't think so. At the end of the day, if the opponent just kills a launder before it got any triggers, it doesn't necessarily do all that much, maybe still gets back a small creature. So it's good, I don't think it's great. So probably a B instead of an A, but maybe uh, in the right deck I could see this going even higher. Cemetery Tampering, 3 mana, a rare enchantment with hideaway 5. Saying at the beginning of your upkeep, you may mill three cards, and then if there are 20 or more cards in your graveyard, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So kind of a self-mill engine. You have to be pretty committed to the mill theme to consider this. And I don't think the average limited deck, even with a little bit of graveyard synergy, is going to be all that interested in tampering. 
20 cards in graveyard is a lot when you're playing a 40 card deck. I guess you can at some point uh, stop milling yourself once you reach the hideaway amount. Kind of a tricky card to evaluate once again. Let's say you play this turn 3, how many turns does it take before you get to 20 cards if you're not necessarily casting a whole lot of spells? It's still going to take a while to get to 20. So, yeah, not a huge fan of tampering, although, again, there could be scenarios where this is the perfect enabler for your graveyard's synergies, but I've yet to see a ton of payoff cards for it, so kind of hesitant to give it too high of a grade. So we'll start out with a conservative C, but um, yeah, going to be a, an interesting card to play with. Corrupt Court Official, 2 mana, 1-1 one, one Human Advisor at common, and when it enters a battlefield, target opponent discards a card. So this is the perfect early sacrifice fodder to enable your various casualty cards, for instance. And uh, yeah, just gives you a nice early play. If this is going to be a grindy format, then making a 1-1 while making the opponent discard is a nice bit of card advantage. When you may not be want to, when you may not want to play a whole lot of other two drops in a format. So a lot to like about this one. Gets a C plus. Crooked custodian had two mana, three two ogre rogue at common enters a battlefield tapped. So want to be in a slightly more aggressive deck, maybe thinking of those riveteer aggro decks, as opposed to the more controlling obscura or uh, maestros decks. So maybe not quite as flexible as the previous 2-drop. Still seems okay, but we'll give it a C. Cut off the profits. X double black for a rare sorcery with casualty 3. So that's a little bit steep, having to sacrifice a creature with at least power 3 or greater. But we get to draw X cards and lose X life. So let's say it's relatively late in the game, cast this for x equals 4 or 5. We have a random 3-drop we don't care about, or other 3-powered creature. And then all of a sudden we're drawing maybe 8 or 10 cards. It is costing us quite a bit of life as well. So it's not going to be something we can pull off against any old deck. But casualty is still kind of a... Uh, a May ability so we don't have to sacrifice anything if we only want to get half the amount of cards. So yeah, card with a lot of potential, similar to the blue mythic that drew a ton of cards. This is a little bit cheaper, but we're just having to pay some life for it as well. But I still like at least a B for cut of the profits. Cutthroat Contender, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Vampire Warrior at common, saying pay 1 life to give it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. You can only activate it once each turn. Yeah, not sure where this is supposed to slot in. Um, an aggressive 1-drop, I guess maybe Riveteers. Although I wouldn't rely on my 1-drops necessarily coming into play on turn 1 in a 3-color a deck where you want to be playing a lot of tap lands for fixing early. So, not a fan of the contender, but there might be a deck for it. Still gonna start out giving it a D. Deal gone bad. 4 mana instant at common, giving a creature minus 3 minus 3 until end of turn, and then target player mills 3 cards, which should be strict upside under most circumstances. So 4 mana for this effect, a little pricey, although it does have the upside of getting around shield counters, as it's not necessarily uh, destroying the creature or dealing damage to it. Definitely factors into the equation a little bit. It is an instant, so we can shrink down a very large creature and then still maybe block it to take it out. Just a little pricey, so I think C for deal gone bad. Demon's Dew, 4 mana instant, making us scry 2, and then draw 2 cards at the cost of 2 life. So I'm a little bit more excited about this one as opposed to the blue 4 mana card draw 
scry to before drawing, especially in the late game when we don't need lands anymore, is a significant upside. Paying to a life, of course, a little bit of a cost, but uh, still doesn't keep me from giving this a C+. Dig up the body, 3 mana instance, at common with casualty 1, saying mill 2 cards, and then we may return a creature card from our graveyard to our hand. So in the right deck, with maybe a bit of graveyard synergy, could be a nice raise dead effect. So casualty 1, not too expensive, and then maybe get 2 creatures back, while maybe milling and finding more exciting creatures to get back in the first place. Not an effect we want a ton of copies of in our deck. Might be like a one-off, but uh, yeah, probably one of you're happy to have. Give it a C. Then we have a Dusk Mangler, a 7 mana, 5 for Horror at Uncommon. As an additional cost to cast it, we either sacrifice a creature, discard a card, or pay for life. So one of those. And then we get a creature that when it enters makes the opponent sacrifice a creature, discard a card, and lose for life. So we only have to do one of those, whereas the opponent has to do all of them. Now by the time we can cast Dusk Mangler, the opponent may not have any cards left in hand. So the discard mode, probably not all that exciting. A little expensive, not the best stats, but has a good ETB effect. So overall, I think C+. Seems okay. Extract the truth, 2 mana sorcery at common, either making the opponent sacrifice an enchantment, or target opponent reveals their hands, and we can choose a creature enchantment or planeswalker card to make them discard. A little pricey for kind of a targeted discard effect. Uh, I do like the fact that it hits creatures, which are the most common card you want to take away, but it's going to feel pretty bad if you ever miss with it. Uh, it does have the upside of late game, once the opponent's empty-handed, can still use it as kind of a disenchant, although not every deck is going to have a ton of enchantments. So I'm still not thrilled about it, so probably still closer to a D than a C. But uh, especially if the opponent has some bomb enchantment like the various ascendancies, I could see wanting to sideboard this in, but still probably not more than a D. Fake your own death. Two mana instant at common, saying until end of turn target creature gets plus two plus two, and when that creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control, and we get to create a treasure token. So an effect we've seen in the past, uh, this has a bit of an interesting twist, giving plus 2 plus 0 and making a treasure token. So it's a reasonable combo trick, especially when paired with creatures that have a nice enter the battlefield ability, as we get to re-trigger it when the creature comes back. So it plays well with like the 2-mana the 1-1 one -one that makes the opponent discard, and uh, we could also combine it with the casualty mechanic, I suppose play this, maybe get an attack in, and then sacrifice your creature, and bring it back. So it's a reasonable combo trick in black, probably don't want a ton of these, but uh, maybe as a one-off could be okay, give it a C. Also plays well with Blitz potentially, that's a fair point. Girder Goons, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Ogre Warrior at common, and when it dies create a tapped 2-2 two, two black rogue creature token and has Blitz for 4 mana. So if we cast it for its Blitz costs, gains haste, and when that creature dies, draw a card and sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Pretty interesting card, let's say we do play it for Blitz, then we can maybe get 4 damage in, make a 2-2, two -two, a tapped 2-2, two -two, and we get to draw a card. That's not a bad deal. And then sometimes we'll play it as a 5-drop, which uh, still leaves behind a 2-2 when it dies. So for a common, this offers a nice bit of flexibility, a decent bit of uh, power and toughness, and has a couple synergies across multiple colors as well. So yeah, I think the goons 
gets a C plus, solid common. Graveyard Shift, one of the few reanimation effects in the set. A 5 mana uncommon sorcery, returning target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. And if we somehow have 5 or more mana values among cards in our graveyard, it also has Flash. Which does make it significantly more powerful, but uh, not going to happen very often. So, yeah, I guess you can live the dream of uh, combining this with maybe a connive card to discard your bomb and then reanimate it on turn 5. So that does make it a little bit better than other 5 mana reanimation effects in previous expansions because connive is one of the key mechanics of the set which gives you kind of that built-in discard outlet that also wants you to be discarding non-land cards to begin with. Historically, I wouldn't give these a very high grade. In this set, maybe goes up in value slightly, but still not a card I'm thrilled about. I'll give it a C. Grizzly Sigil is a 1-mana sorcery at uncommon with casualty 1, saying choose target creature or planeswalker. If it was dealt non-combat damage this turn, Sigil deals 3 damage to it and you gain 3 life. Authorized Sigil deals 1 damage to it, and you gain 1 life. Pretty strange card. I guess it could be good if the opponent has a bunch of low toughness creatures that you can take out. Still seems more of like a, a sideboard card to me than a card I'm excited to main deck. Dealing non combat damage is not trivial, so it's probably going to be 1 damage for the most part. And as a sorcery, it's not necessarily going to catch the opponent off guard either, so... Yeah, I think uh, D for Grizzly Sigil, but could be an okay sideboard card. Illicit Shipment, 5 mana uncommon sorcery with casualty 3, so pretty steep. To search our library for a card and put it into our hand. So we get kind of an Infernal Tutor for 5 mana, so quite pricey but we can potentially search two cards. Can't imagine too many scenarios where I have like two cards I actively want to find. Maybe if we have some insane bombs that can catch us back up after spending five mana not impacting the board. So it's gonna be a card you probably leave out your deck more often than not. Gets a D. Incriminate, 2 mana sorcery at common, saying choose 2 target creatures controlled by the same player. That player sacrifices one of them. Alright, so solves a few of the issues that edict effects tend to have of the opponent just sacrificing their worst creature. Now they just sacrifice their second worst creature. So it's not perfect, but at 2 mana it's relatively efficient. Sacrifice gets around shield counters as well. So that's neat, but still not a card I'm thrilled about. Gets a C. And join the Maestros, a 5 mana sorcery at common, with casualty 2, and creates a 4 3 black ogre warrior creature token. Alright, so if we have some 2 powered creature we don't care about, then this is 5 mana to add 8 power and 6 toughness to the board. So, yeah, not, not a bad deal. That's a lot of stats to maybe catch you back up. Without casualty, pretty unexciting. So you kind of need to have a creature with at least 2 power that you're willing to sacrifice. So, kind of depends how your deck is set up, I suppose. But uh, I think it's a playable card. So I'll give Join the Maestros a C. Maestros Initiates, a 3 mana 3-1, three human citizen, so a relevant creature type at common, and then has that hybrid activated ability, which is also a cycle that we'll see in every color. And this is 5 mana, hybrid blue or red, and then we exile the Initiate from our graveyard to draw 2 cards and then discard a card. So good if we 
discard it to connive. Good if we sacrifice it to maybe one of the uh, casualty cards. Good if we mill it to our various mill effects. So quite a few synergies with the initiate. And then it's a 3 mana 3 1, which is by no means exciting, but still presents something on the board. And then it's also a citizen, if we happen to have any citizen synergies, although that's more of a, a green white thing as opposed to a, a blue, black, or red thing. So overall, initiate gets a C, plus, solid card. Midnight Assassin, 3 mana, 1 2, Vampire Assassin at common with Flying and Death Touch. So, can uh, hold off most of the opponent's creatures, unless maybe they've got some shield counters. Uh, not the best attacker, but a, a good blocker. So, yeah, not a card we're too excited about, but if you need a, an early defensive option, then this could do. Gets a C. Murder is back. 3 mana instant at common this time, has been at a few different rarities. But uh, yeah, just destroy target creature. Doesn't get around shield counters, so that makes it a little bit worse than it would be otherwise. But still one of the most efficient removal spells you can get these days to deal with pretty much any creature from the opponent. So a definition of a B, just an unconditional removal spell. Knight Clubber. 3 mana, 2-2 two, two, Human Warrior at Uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield, creatures your opponent's control get minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn, and can also be played for its Blitz cost, which is just 2 and a black. So yeah, there's a lot to like about it. Sometimes you just want to use this to deal with a bunch of 1 toughness tokens or creatures, and then you would rather draw a card as opposed to have a 2-2 two, two creature left over. So... Blitz is nice, deals with those unblockable fish tokens nicely, and uh, can sometimes play its second main phase to finish off a creature that uh, dies once it's down one extra point of toughness. So pretty flexible, and going to be quite backbreaking for a lot of the Cabaretti decks. Gets a B. Rafine's Silencer, a 3 mana, 1-1 one, one Human Assassin at Uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, it connives. And when the silencer dies, target creature an opponent controls gets minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the silencer's power. So this is one of those creatures that you absolutely want to make sure it picks up a plus one counter, as that will drastically improve its quality. And if you can make it a 2-2, two -two, that when it dies gives something minus two, minus two. That's pretty decent. Um, can maybe be sacrificed and then still take something down with it. And we got to maybe improve our hand in the meantime. So yeah, Silencer looks okay. Requires a little bit of work. Maybe not as exciting in the late game if you're discarding a land to it. So probably can give it more than a C+. Ravel Ruiner, 4 mana, 3 1, Cephalid Rogue at common with Menace, and when it enters the battlefield, it also connives. So let's say we make it a 4 2 Menace for 4. Yeah, that's okay. Still probably pretty average for a 4 drop. Gets a C. Rogue's Gallery can be quite exciting. A 3 mana, uncommon sorcery, saying for each color. Return up to one target creature card of, of that color from your graveyard to your hand. So this is a nice incentive to maybe splash a fourth or even a fifth color. As uh, you can potentially get back a whole bunch of multicolor creatures with it. So they just have to be at least that color. They don't have to be only that color. So that gives you a ton more options of uh, which creatures you get back and it shouldn't be too difficult to get at least three creatures back with it, assuming you're playing a three-color deck, and could even be better the more colors you add. Maybe a bit of synergy with self-mill as well, good with blitz, good with casualty, so it covers a lot of bases, so probably the best in class when it comes to these raised dead effects. So I'll give Rogue's Gallery 
the very least a C+. But uh, if you can live the dream of playing this in a 5-color deck, could be one of your best cards. Sanguine Spy, 3 mana, 2, 3, Vampire Rogue at rare, has Menace and Lifelink, and an activated ability for 1 mana to sacrifice another creature, and then we essentially get to surveil, look at the top card of our library, and we may put it into our graveyard. And at the beginning of our end step, if we have 5 or more mana values among cards in our graveyard, we may pay 2 life, and if we do, draw a card. So very powerful if we can enable that last ability, especially because lifelink helps offset the life loss a little bit. And sacrificing creatures can help enable the final ability by putting additional mana values in the graveyard, not only by sacking the creature, but also milling additional cards essentially. So kind of a self-enabling engine, and uh, ideally we have some good sacrifice fodder alongside it, like the blue 1-drop or the black 2-drop making the opponent discard have been some of the, the better sacrifice fodder creatures we've seen so far. So overall, what do we give Sanguine Spy? It's still 1 mana to activate, it's not like there's a ton of sacrifice fodder going around, so I think I'm leaning towards B, but uh, if the set had a ton of expendable creatures, I could see it going up in value. Then we have Shadow of Mortality, kind of a, a take on Death Shadow. 13 and double black, so 15 mana total. For a 7-7 avatar at rare, saying if your life total is less than your starting life total, this spell costs X generic mana less to cast, where X is the difference. So let's say we're at 10 life, difference is 10, then it costs 5 mana to get a 7-7. And we can go as low as just paying double black if we're at 7 or less life. So tricky cards to evaluate. Um, there's a few ways to lower our own life total. We've just seen the uh, Sanguine Spy. There's a 1-drop that lets us pay 1 life. So those are ways to potentially artificially lower our own life total if the opponent doesn't cooperate. But it's not like we're playing a combo deck in modern here. So for the most part, we'll have to wait for the opponent to naturally attack us and then we can maybe play this at a, a discount. If the format tends to be slow, what does that mean for Shadow? That the opponent might build up a big board and then we might not have a whole lot of time to deploy Shadow because we're gonna kind of die very quickly as opposed to maybe a more aggressive format where the opponent gets us to maybe 10 life by turn 4 and then we can play this for very cheap to stabilize. So. Yeah, not sure what to make of Shadow. Definitely one of the more difficult cards for me to rate. But I'll start out with a C plus as a card that, you know, potentially can be very cheap and uh, still quite sizable as a 7-7. Seven, seven. Shakedown Heavy, 3 mana, 6-4 Ogre Warrior at rare, has Menace, and when the Heavy attacks, defending player may have you draw a card, if they do, untap the heavy and remove it from combat. So the fact that we get to untap is, is important, because then we can still play defense with it. Yeah, it's one of those cards giving the opponent a choice, which, you know, historically isn't as good as it may seem at first glance. Early on, the opponent might take a hit or two. If they really cannot handle it, then possible you get to draw a card or two. That's the best case scenario. Sometimes you draw this late and it just trades off for the opponent's 3-drop and it didn't really accomplish much. But I guess Menace does make it a, a little bit more difficult for the opponent to block profitably. So yeah, when played early, the heavy is going to be quite a menace for the opponent. But uh, again, as all these cards giving the opponent a choice, maybe give it a slightly lower grade than you would uh, upon first read. So, overall, Shakedown Heavy, probably still a B at the very least. If it weren't for the fact that we're giving the opponent a choice, it could be even better. Tavern Swindler is back, has been reprinted a few times now, 
A 2-2 human rogue at uncommon can tap it, pay 3 life to flip a coin. If you win, gain 6 life. There's no real, I guess, life gain theme in this set. So outside of the flavor, I don't think the Swindler is doing a whole lot. And uh, therefore, probably just gets a D. Tenacious Underdog, 2 mana, 3 2 Human Warrior at rare, has Blitz for 4 mana and pay 2 life as well. And we may cast the Underdog from our graveyard using its Blitz ability. So, very unique effect. And uh, means that we can, in the late game, pay 4 mana and 2 life to draw a card thanks to Blitz when the creature dies end of turn. So. Gives us a reasonable mana sink, good card early. Um, so yeah, overall a pretty nice package. Getting a B. Vampire Scrivener, five mana, two two Vampire Warlock and uncommon. It flies, and whenever you gain life during your turn, put a plus one counter on it. Whenever you lose life during your turn, also put a plus one counter on it. So there are a couple synergies. I guess this is maybe a card to combo with the Tavern Swindler. Uh, probably the best card with it, as it both makes us lose life and gain life. But then we're playing two kind of mediocre cards to make one card slightly better. Same goes with the one drop that wasn't very good, that allowed us to pay life. I think this is better alongside, let's say, the four mana card draw spell that makes us lose two life. If you also happen to have some lifelink, maybe still kind of expensive at 5 mana. And uh, yeah, not a card I expect to be amazing, but there are definitely some cool synergies to discover with it. So maybe if your draft isn't going all that well, this is a card you can pick up pretty late. And then if you happen to have synergies with it, you can make it work, but not a card I would initially want to take highly. So Scrivener gets a D. Whack, a 4 mana sorcery at uncommon, costs 3 generic mana less to cast if it targets a white creature, giving it minus 4 minus 4 until end of turn. So has quite a few similarities with the author removal spell we've seen, the uh, deal gone bad I believe, which gave minus 3, although that one was an instant. This is a sorcery, but gives minus 4 minus 4, and has that great upside if it targets a white creature. So part of that cycle of hate cards. So overall I think Wack is probably better than Deal Gone Bad, despite being a sorcery. And uh, yeah, therefore gets a C+. Probably a card I'm happy to main deck, but uh, you know can be sided out if the opponent doesn't have any white creatures, or if they have creatures that line up favorably against the minus 4, minus 4. Also again worth pointing out that it does help you get around shield counters by reducing toughness instead of dealing damage or destroying. So that's also pretty neat. First red card is Antagonize, 2 mana instant at common, giving a creature plus 4 plus 3 until end of turn, card I alluded to when discussing the double strike creature in white, which could combo with it pretty nicely. So yeah, powerful combo trick slash pump spell to maybe deal a couple extra points of damage. Unclear which uh, color pair makes the best use of it. Maybe the Riveteers could be okay in Cabaretti, where you're attacking with a bunch of 1 1s, and then you can take out the creature that's blocking one of your tokens. So, yeah, solid combo trick, at the very least, to see. Arcane Bombardment is a very interesting mythic. Six mana enchantments saying whenever you cast your Whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, exile an instant or sorcery card at random from your graveyard, and then copy each card exiled with Arcane Bombardment, and you may cast any number of the copies without paying their mana costs. So quite a mouthful. Pretty slow card to get going, requires you to have plenty of instants and sorceries, so at its best out of the red uh, color pairs probably in the Maestros, which can also maybe help fill your graveyard to begin with. So that's where I would be looking to leverage Arcane Bombardment. 
not a card you can necessarily play in any red deck as again you do need enough instants and sorceries so yeah six mana doesn't immediately impact the board kind of reads like one of those uh, janky mythic rares that might be fun to build around but don't necessarily deliver but if you get to untap with it it can certainly take over pretty quickly so it has potential and if the format ends up being as slow as I hope and think it will be, could actually uh, help you take over the game once uh, it copies a couple spells. So I cannot give it a super high grade in good conscience, but uh, probably start out with a C. Big score, 4 mana instant at common. As an additional cost, discard a card to draw 2 and create 2 treasure tokens. Yeah, this... Definitely takes a lot of boxes, helping you fix your mana, ramp, maybe set up your graveyard, filter through the deck. So, seems like a nice 4 mana play, and kind of an upgraded version of Unexpected Windfall, which was already pretty decent, so not much more we can ask from Big Score. Gets a C+. Plus. Call in a professional 3 mana instant at Uncommon saying players cannot gain life, damage cannot be prevented, and then deal 3 damage to any target. And it also specifically says shield counters don't prevent this damage as they're removed. So that's why this card is actually pretty nice in this set, being able to get around shield counters. Not a whole bunch of life gain necessarily, but every now and then you might be able to prevent some life gain from lifelink. And uh, yeah, 3 mana, 3 damage, still relatively efficient. So C+. Plus. Daring Escape, a 1 mana instant, combo trick at common, giving a creature plus 1 plus 2, and first strike until end of turn, and we get to scry 1 as well. Yeah, a reasonable combo trick. Maybe not quite as exciting as the 2 mana, plus 4 plus 3 that we've already covered, since this requires your creature to be pretty close in size to what's maybe blocking it. So probably closer to a D and not my first choice of comma trick. Devilish Valet, 3 mana, 1, 3, Devil Warrior at rare. It has Trample and Haste and Alliance doubles its power whenever another creature enters under our control. So if we can trigger this a couple times, especially if it already has increased power, it could deal a significant amount of damage, potentially even one hit KO the opponent. Is that gonna happen reliably is a question. In a Cabaretti deck where you've got a lot of creatures making tokens, it should be pretty feasible. Maybe also the deck where you're playing a couple equipment to enhance your tokens, which can then pump up your devil which can then uh, potentially deal upwards of 10 damage. So, yeah, the valet seems pretty decent, gets a B. Exhibition Magician, a 3-mana 2-1 human wizard at common, and when it enters, either makes a treasure token, similar to the Barbarian from the uh, D20 set, and then we can also make a 1-1 one, one green and white citizen creature token instead. So then we get a 2-1, and we get a 1-1, one, one, so two creatures for three mana. Good for the Cabaretti decks. So pretty flexible treasure tokens, again quite valuable in a set full of three color decks. So I think I'm willing to give this a C+. Plus. Glittering Stockpile, three mana uncommon treasure artifact. Taps to add red mana, put a stash counter on it, can tap the stockpile and sacrifice it, adding X mana of any one color, where X is the number of stash counters on it. Can ramp a little bit, eventually also fix your mana, but only makes red mana to begin with. So, yeah, if you're in the market for a ramp card, this will do but uh, not maybe as excited about it as some early treasure tokens, which also fix your mana, so I'll give it a C. Goldhound is next, a 1 mana, 1-1 one, one treasure dog, artifact creature with a first strike and menace, and as any treasure can be sacrificed, adding 1 mana of any color. 
So in a very aggressive deck, this could be a solid role player. Not sure how common those will be, but maybe you can punish greedy three-color decks by drafting a more streamlined two-color deck. Although most of the payoffs and powerful cards are going to be three-color uh, cards. So I think that's going to be more of an exception. So that also kind of lowers the power of Goldhound a little bit. If we're just using it as a one-time treasure, I don't think that's quite going to cut it in limited. So I'll start out with a, a C, might end up closer to a D, but certainly a card that has some uh, constructed applications. Horde Hauler, 4 mana, 5-5, five, five, vehicle at rare. It tramples, crew cost is 3, and when it deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token for each artifact they control. Don't expect the opponent to have a ton of artifacts in play. A 5-5 five, five for 4, crew cost of 3, eh, not that exciting, it does trample I guess. So it's a pretty average vehicle around that mana cost. So Horde Hauler gets a C. Next we have Involuntary Employment, 4 mana sorcery at uncommon. Gaining control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature gains haste, so your typical act of treason effect. But we also get to create a treasure token, is kind of the interesting twist here. You can maybe combine this with uh, casualty, but then you'll need the mana for both employment and your casualty card, which might be a little bit more difficult to set up. So overall, I'll give this a C. Jackhammer, a 2 mana equipment at common, giving plus 2 plus 0, equips for 2 mana. So it could be quite nice in like a Cabaretti deck looking to pump up its 1 1 tokens. But uh, yeah, nothing special here. So we'll give it a C. Jaxus, the Troublemaker, 4 mana, 2 3. Legendary Human Warrior at rare. Can pay a red mana, tap it, and discard a card to create a token that's a copy of another target creature you control and essentially gains the Blitz ability. When it dies, draw a card and sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. And also has Blitz itself for one on a red. So pretty interesting card, plays well with creatures that have Enter the Battlefield abilities. So that's what you're looking to set up. We'll uh, play probably quite nicely in your Riveteer decks and your maybe Cabaretti decks with creatures that make tokens when they enter the battlefield. So you still have something left over. So yeah, Jaxus, a powerful utility creature, gets a B. Light them up, 2 mana sorcery at common, casualty of 2, dealing 2 damage to target creature or planeswalker. So this should be kind of an exciting card. Your cheap 2 mana burn spell has uh, recently often gotten a B grade as kind of the cheap efficient removal spell. Not actually all that excited about light em up. The casualty is kind of expensive at 2 as opposed to 1. It's sorcery speed and it's only 2 damage to begin with. Doesn't even go face. So kind of down on light em up. Especially the format ends up being kind of slow. Then 2 damage doesn't take out what you need to take out. So pretty low on uh, this card overall. Gets a D. Mayhem Patrol, 2 mana, 1, 2, Devil Warrior at common, has Menace, and Blitz for 1 in a red, and when the patrol attacks, target creature gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. So it can pump itself, making it a 2-2 a two, two Menace for 2 when it attacks, which is a pretty good deal, and then Blitz gives it additional flexibility. So in the late game, if it's not relevant on the board, you can still uh, potentially draw a card with it. So, yeah, Patrol seems like a solid 2-drop. Gets a C+. Plus. Plasma Jockey, 4 mana, 3-1 Vyashina Warrior at common. When it attacks, target creature an opponent controls cannot block this turn and has Blitz for 2 and a red. So, out of nowhere, this can represent a lot of damage. Not only are you attacking with a hasty 3-powered creature, but removing a blocker also opens up a lot more extra damage. So it could be a solid finisher for like an aggressive Riveteers deck and uh, the flexibility of Blitz 
is what uh, makes this much more powerful. And uh, yeah, sometimes you just play it for four mana. It's a little bit slower then, but can maybe consistently prevent the opponent's largest creature from blocking. So overall, I think give Jockey a C. Kind of expensive, but could be a nice finisher. Professional Facebreaker, 3 mana, 2 3 human warrior at rare, has menace, saying whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token, and we can sacrifice a treasure at any time to exile the top card of our library and play that card this turn so we can play lands as well. So ideally, you've got a, a 2 drop in play already that can deal damage to the opponent the turn we play the Face Breaker so we get an extra treasure. And uh, yeah, those treasures will quickly add up, can turn them into card advantage. So the phase breaker doesn't mess around. And I think gets the A grade here, bomb worthy card that can quickly take over a game, even without an early creature, still has menace itself. So especially on the play, should be able to connect at least once. Pugnacious Pugilist, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Ogre Warrior at Uncommon, has Blitz for 4 mana, and when it attacks, create a tapped and attacking 1-1 one, one Red Devil creature token that when it dies deals 1 damage to any target. So pretty big creature, Blitz also pretty efficient, and we might have a leftover Devil token. So yeah, when playing against the Riveteer's Blitz deck, You'll have to make sure to leave back enough blockers, otherwise you could be staring at a ton of damage. So Pugilist good at both 4 mana or 5 mana. And uh, that Devil token is what sells me here, gets a B. The Paris Slanch Arsonist, a 3 mana 2-2 two, two Vaishino Shaman at Uncommon, can pay 1 mana tap it to deal X damage to any target where X is the number of permanents you've sacrificed this turn. Gonna be a little tricky to necessarily sacrifice something and activate Arsonist. I guess Blitz is one way to do it if you have a leftover mana or with casualty, but then you're maybe still only dealing one damage. Now one damage could still be relevant at taking out uh, shield counters from the opponent, and then I guess you could also count treasure tokens as additional permanents you can sacrifice. So yeah, uh, taking out shield counters, using treasure tokens to increase its damage, those are the, the kind of synergies we're looking for. That being said, I'm still not excited about a 3-mana 2-2 two -two that can occasionally do something extra. So it might be more of a sideboard card against decks with a lot of shield counters or one toughness creatures. Otherwise, I'm probably not that interested. So I'll start out with a D, but we'll see how it plays out. Ready to rumble, 5 mana sorcery at common, either dealing 5 damage to a creature or planeswalker, or destroying target artifact. So pretty inefficient, I would say, at 5 mana. Dealing 5 damage at sorcery speed, doesn't exile, doesn't get around shield counters either, so not all that excited about this. But if your deck doesn't have any removal, then you might have to play this as a necessary evil, but that's not really a great selling point. So give it a C, but a pretty low C at that. Riveteer's Initiate is a part of that hybrid cycle. 2 mana, 2-2 two, two Vaishino Citizen at common, and has a activated ability for 1 and either black or green, giving it a death touch until end of turn. So the threat of activation here quite important, can attack into larger creatures. If you have mana untapped, the opponent has to respect the ability, and then you don't have to activate it and just cast something else, and you got two damage in. So kind of like making it unblockable in a way sometimes. And then sometimes you can also keep it on defense to block a larger creature. So there's a lot to like about it, and uh, we haven't seen a ton of particularly exciting two drops so far and two drops are still important and limited. If you get your two drop out and the opponent doesn't, then uh, you could potentially accumulate a lot of free damage, which uh, quickly adds up. So all that just to give the initiate a C plus. 
Next up, Riveteer's Requisitioner, 2 mana, 3 1 Vyashino Rogue at Uncommon, and has Blitz for 2 and a red. And when the Requisitioner dies, create a treasure token. So if we use the Blitz ability, it's gonna die naturally. But as a 3 1, it also tends to trade. And uh, yeah, we're still only paying 2 mana for it and potentially make a treasure token in the process. And uh, if the opponent doesn't trade for it, then a 3 powered creature hits pretty hard. So yeah, there's a lot to like about the Requisitioner. So gets a C plus as well. We've got Rob the Archives, 2 mana, Sorcery at Uncommon, Casualty cost is just 1, saying exile the top 2 cards of your library, and you may play those cards this turn. So interesting card. I think the best case scenario for this is we're kind of in the mid game, we maybe have 5 or 6 mana, and we've got an expendable creature we don't mind sacrificing. Play Rob the Archives before playing land for the turn, Sacrifice a creature, now we get to exile four cards, likely to find a land we can play, and then maybe we still have two or three spells we can cast that turn, but we also need the mana right away to cast it. So, yeah, it requires a little bit of setup, but it does provide a significant amount of card advantage. So that's nice. Probably gets better the lower curve your deck is, so the more likely you can actually cast all the cards in time. And yeah, looking at four cards for two mana, that gets to dig pretty deep. So yeah, in a low curve deck, I could see this doing quite a bit of work. But uh, yeah, requires a little bit of building around. So I'll start out with a C, but I could see this moving up as well. Sizzling Soloist, 4 mana, Uncommon Human Citizen, a relevant creature type, 3-2, with Alliance, saying whenever another creature enters under your control, target creature an opponent controls cannot block this turn, and if this triggered for the second time, then that creature attacks during its controller's next combat phase if able. Yeah, that card seems pretty strong in your Cabaretti decks, or you can consistently trigger it twice for something to attack. Then you can set up favorable blocks to take it out. Uh, although that being said, Cabaretti has a lot of small creatures, so you can't necessarily have that large blocker back to uh, punish the opponent for attacking. So yeah, good in, in an aggressive deck just to kind of take out blockers and then triggering it twice I guess also kind of forces the attack, which frees an extra blocker as well. So the more aggressive your deck, the better. And uh, yeah, that should fit right into most Cabaretti decks. So C plus for Soloist. Sticky Fingers, a one mana enchantment aura. And it says when the Enchanted creature deals comma damage to a player, create a treasure token, and it also gives the enchanted creature menace. And then when the creature dies, draw a card. So that last line kind of redeems sticky fingers, so it's less likely to get punished by removal. And then, yeah, both menace and treasure tokens is a nice combo for any more aggressive deck or deck trying to fix its colors and ramp into big exciting plays. So it will require enough cheap creatures to enchant, but assuming that's the case, Sticky Fingers could actually be playable, so I'll give it a C. Strangle is next, pretty exciting removal spell for just a single red mana as a common sorcery dealing 3 damage to a creature or planeswalker. So yeah, three damage. That's uh, not gonna be enough to take out larger creatures in the late game, but especially for a more controlling deck, can uh, kind of uh, deal with the opponent's early aggression, can get a much more efficient removal spell than this, even though it doesn't go face to burn an opponent out. So this kind of uh, replaces the uh, light them up we've seen earlier at 2 mana as kind of the 
the exciting removal spell in red that gets a B. Structural Assault, a 5 mana, a rare sorcery, destroying all artifacts, and then Assault deals damage to each creature equal to the number of artifacts that were put into graveyards from the battlefield this turn. Yeah, not really too excited about Structural Assault. Can't imagine this dealing too much damage. And uh, yeah, just requires a little bit too much setup. So... I think this might be one of the few other uh, F-grade cards in the set. Torch Breath, instant add on common for X and a red, costing two less to cast if it targets a blue permanent, so part of our hate cycle, cannot be countered, and deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker. So it doesn't go upstairs, sadly. Uncounterable. I guess is slightly relevant. And then targeting blue stuff. Getting a discount is nice. Although blue creatures, the ones that you want to take out for the most part, tend to be small flyers that don't have a ton of toughness. But it does mean we can potentially cast this for a single red and still deal two damage to a blue creature at instant speed. So, a reasonable card. Um, if you're not targeting a blue creature, you're never getting a great deal. I'll give it a C. Unlucky Witness is another great creature to potentially sacrifice as a 1-1 uncommon human citizen that when it dies lets us exile the top two cards of our library and until our next end step we may play one of those cards. So we can play lanes and we don't have to play the card right away. We get an extra turn to potentially cast it. So a perfect card to sacrifice to casualty and uh, therefore gets a C+. Plus. Then we have Ourobrask, Heretic, Praetor, the 5 mana 4-4, four, four, Legendary, Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic, has Haste, says at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library, and we get to play it this turn, whereas the opponent has to exile the top card of their library, that basically replaces their draw step, so they have to cast the card from exile, Otherwise, it goes away. I guess they can play lands as well. So, the yeah, opponent has to play the cards they top deck, otherwise they lose them. Which can significantly throw off their curve or their plans. So if they don't have an immediate answer to Orbrask, they're uh, gonna fall behind very quickly as we accumulate extra cards, and the opponent maybe misses a couple draw steps. And uh, a 4-4 with haste also gets to attack right away doesn't have any built-in protection but the fact that it has haste and if it doesn't get answered right away just quickly runs away with the game not only providing card advantage but also disrupting the opponent's game plan i think nudges it into the s camp whereas you know you could argue that it's closer to an a because there are still quite a few removal spells that can answer it cleanly but i think it has enough going for it here that uh, will go all the way. Widespread Thieving, 3 mana, rare enchantment, hideaway 5, says whenever you cast a multicolored spell, create a treasure token, and then you may pay one of each color, and if you do, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. Wow, this is a pretty strange card. So, this is kind of your payoff for building some weird 4-5 color deck. Uh, the treasures can help pay for the 5 mana ability, but you need to have that mana in addition to casting a multicolor spell. This is going to be kind of tricky to set up. This doesn't really do much the turn you play it. And, you know, if you're already casting multicolored spells, like how many more treasures do you really need at that point? Seems a little too dirtly. But uh, yeah, I could see some weird scenario where you're playing four or five colors and this not only fixes, but eventually casts a powerful card for free. I'll give it a D, but uh, could be closer to an F. Witty Roastmaster, three mana, three two, devil citizen at common with alliance dealing one damage to each opponent. 
So we'll nicely roast the opponents slowly. And uh, yeah, three mana, three, two, still reasonable stats. And we don't have to attack with it to deal damage. So perfect for your Cabaretti decks. And if the board stalls out, you still have a, a source of damage. So C plus for Roastmaster. A Wrecking Crew, five mana, four, five Human Warrior at common has a reach and trample so yeah just reasonable stats for five mana nothing exciting no particular synergies but also can't really go wrong with it gets a c we're starting out strong here with vivian on the hunt six mana for loyalty planeswalker has a plus two saying we may sacrifice a creature if we do search our library for a creature card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrificed creature's mana value and put it onto the battlefield we can minus one creating a 4-4 green rhino warrior creature token and we can plus one milling five cards and putting any number of creature cards milled this way into our hand well, for the most part, I think we're going to play Vivian and make a couple Rhino Warriors, which quickly add up. Now, we don't necessarily have any built-in reach. So if we're pretty far behind on boards, especially if the opponent has some flying creatures out, that's where Vivian might fall a little bit short. But if the board is anywhere near stable, Vivian's completely going to take over the game protects herself nicely with those rhino warriors even if you don't have anything else going on so yeah with a small asterisk of potentially still losing to flyers vivian gets an s attended socialite two mana two one elf druid at common with alliance giving it plus one plus one until end of turn yeah solid two drop especially for cabaretti decks outside of it Probably nothing amazing, but gets a C. Bootlegger's Stash, a 6-mana Mythic Rare Artifact, saying a lance you control can tap to create a treasure token. Okay, well, this is a very interesting concept. Kind of reminiscent of the, the Red Hellkite from Zendikar that let you store up mana in a way as you can now store up any unused mana in the form of treasure tokens. Don't, now the problem with Stash is that it costs 6 mana, so we're paying 6 mana to not do anything, and then afterwards we can start saving up mana, maybe fixing our mana with the treasures as well. Although at that point, did we really need the, the Stash to begin with? If it were cheaper, I could definitely see its uh, benefit, but at 6 mana I don't think this is particularly playable. So outside of a weird five-color deck where you desperately need fixing, maybe trying to cast that uh, eight-mana sorcery, I think this is a, a D, maybe closer to an F. A bouncer's beat down, three-mana uncommon instant, costing two less to cast if it targets a black permanent, and then it deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control and exile it as well so kind of a, an interesting take on a bite effect at instant speed three mana so seems pretty solid even if we don't target a black permanent it's pretty much what we're expecting to pay for it and uh, yeah getting that two mana discount could be amazing so c plus for bouncers beat down broken wings reprinted once again Usually a sideboard card, destroying an artifact, enchantment, or a creature with flying. Nothing special here, but if you're playing best of three, going to be a, a nice option to have access to. Gets a D. Cabaretti Initiates, part of the hybrid creature cycle. A one mana, one two, raccoon, citizen at common. Citizen, definitely a relevant creature type. And for two and either a red or white, it gains double strike until end of turn. So wears equipment nicely and gives you a one drop to start out with. But as I've said before, I think one drops in general kind of go down in value in this expansion, just because you have so many tap lands that you'll want to play early. 
So probably better off playing a tap land and a two drop as opposed to one drop and then being stuck with your tap land later in the game. So that's combined with, you know, a relatively low impact unless you equip it. Doesn't give the initiates uh, an incredibly high grade, but I think it's still playable. So we'll give it a C. Kaldaya, strong arm, 5 mana, 2 3 human warrior at common. When it enters, put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on a target creature and can also be blitzed for 4 mana. So if we use blitz, we get maybe 2 damage, 2 counters, and a card. Not a bad deal. And then we have the flexibility of casting it as a 5 drop. So at 5 mana, not particularly efficient but we can potentially play it as a 4-5 if it's the only creature we have. Sometimes the counters are better served somewhere else, maybe on a creature that has a shield counter for protection. So yeah, the flexibility is definitely quite nice. And uh, overall, might bump it up to a C+. Capenna Express, 4 mana, 6-6 six, six vehicle at common, can sacrifice a treasure to crew it, or we can use creatures the normal way, in which case crew cost is 3. So 4 mana, 6-6, six, six. yeah, that's kind of what's expected. Crew cost 3, nothing special. Um, Sacking treasures to crew it is a nice upside, although you're going to run out of treasures pretty quickly, unless you have that uh, the rare 2-drop, I guess, that makes treasure tokens constantly. So not a card I'm excited about, unless... I've got a ton of treasure or maybe some other synergies like we discussed with the uh, the mythic rare halo fountain requiring you to have a creature or a vehicle rather to tap your creatures but then we're maybe combining two underwhelming cards to create a reasonably powerful effect so that's still questionable overall I'll give it a C Civic Gardener, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two human citizen, at common, and when it attacks, untap target creature or land. So early on this could be kind of nice, letting you, let's say turn 4, you play a 4-drop or maybe a 3-drop pre-combat, attack with it, untap land, play another 2-drop, generating an extra mana, although that ability is gonna fall off pretty quickly once the opponent presents a few blockers. I guess it can also untap itself, so it has pseudo vigilance, which can be uh, pretty nice too. So it's an okay two drop, although in the late game, unlike some of the other two drops I like, not necessarily very impactful, unless you want to use it for one extra mana and uh, essentially sacrifice it. But then again, there are other ways to make use of creatures in the late game with casualty, although not necessarily a green mechanic. So I'll give a Gardener a C. Cleanup Crew, 6 mana, 6-6, six, six, Human Citizen at Uncommon. When it enters, either destroy an artifact, enchantment, exile a card from a graveyard, or gain 4 life. So, kind of a, an interesting take on Honey Mammoth and the uh, Lintworm we've seen recently. And this one does it even better, as we have additional flexibility. And uh, yeah, should be quite decent. So we'll give it a C+. Plus. Courier's Briefcase, 2 mana, uncommon, treasure artifact. Can be sacrificed like a treasure to make 1 mana of any color. When it enters, creates a citizen token. And for 1 of each color, we can tap and sacrifice it to draw 3 cards. So potentially a payoff for the 5 color decks. And uh, also fits nicely into the kind of cabaretti tokens deck that cares about citizens as just a 2-drop that makes a 1-1 one -one token and ramps us. So slightly reminiscent of the Innkeeper, I guess, without the life gain synergy. So I think this is a playable card. Might even get a C plus here. Elegant Entourage, 4 mana for 4 elf druid at uncommon with alliance, giving target creature other than the Entourage plus 1 plus 1 and trample until end of turn. So this is a pretty nice ability if we can make tokens at instant speed. I've seen a few ways so far to do that. And then we can basically use the Entourage as a combo trick in addition to being a 4-mana 4-4, which is already quite decent. 
So yeah, there's quite a bit to like here. Give it a C plus. Next we have Evolving Door, three mana artifact at rare. P can pay one mana, tap it, and sacrifice a creature, counting its colors to look for a creature in our library that's exactly that many colors plus one. Exile it, and we may cast the exile card this turn. Pretty interesting uh, concept here. Pretty tough to evaluate since there's nothing quite like it. Having to actually still cast the card is, of course, uh, a pretty big drawback. And uh, kind of need to build your deck in order to take full advantage of it. Have some one color creature, two color creatures, three color creatures, ideally with nice entered battlefield abilities. Not all that uh, excited about Evolving Door, to be honest, but I'll give it a, a hopeful C to hopefully see it in action. Fight Rigging, 3 mana, rare enchantment, seems quite powerful, has Hideaway 5, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature you control, and then if you control a creature with power 7 or greater, we can play the Hideaway card for free. So yeah, just putting a plus one counter on a creature every turn, pretty decent. And assuming we're in green, we've got some large creatures we can eventually target with a plus one counter, get to seven and cast a card for free. And uh, yeah, the hideaway card could be quite expensive, so might end up uh, saving us some mana in the process. Gets a B. For the family, one mana. Common instance, giving plus two plus two until end of turn as a combo trick. Unless we control four or more creatures, in which case it's plus four plus four instead. So this wants to go in the Cabaretti Go White deck. Outside of it, it's kind of a weak combo trick. So not a card you should be prioritizing highly. But uh, yeah, in the Cabaretti decks, it should be fine. So it gets a C. Freelance Muscle, 5 mana, 4-4, four, four, a Rhino Warrior at Uncommon, and when the Muscle attacks or blocks, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the greatest power and or toughness among other creatures you control. So it takes a second to parse, but yeah, overall, if you have any other creature in play, this is going to be a pretty large attacker or blocker. Uh, doesn't have any fancy abilities, so, you know, could be chum blocked by the opponent, but also kind of a must-answer card, as it will uh, hit incredibly hard, and, uh, yeah, good on defense, good on offense. Ideally, find a way to give a trample or some other evasive ability, but gets a B. Gala Greeters is next, a 2-mana 1-1 one, one Elf Druid at rare, with Alliance giving us the choice of a plus one counter on the Greeters, a tapped treasure token, or two life. So if we can make two creatures in one turn, we're probably going to end up putting a counter on it and making a treasure, but uh, definitely gives us a ton of flexibility and a lot of different options. And uh, if we can play this early in a Cabaretti deck, it's going to take over the game pretty quickly, not only ramping, but growing into a substantial threat itself and has a couple neat combos as well throughout the set, so Gala Greeters has a ton of potential, certainly worthy of a B. Glittermonger, 4 mana, 1 4 elf rogue at common, can tap to create a treasure token. We've seen a few cards, especially in red green, with synergy uh, involving tokens and treasures, especially, and uh, yeah, the Glittermonger, slightly better than just a creature that taps for mana, as we can potentially save up our treasure for future turns. Uh, now it is a 1-4. Usually expect to see like a 2-4 with a mana ability at 4 mana. So we're maybe giving up a little bit of power and toughness there. But uh, yeah, especially in a, a treasure-heavy synergy deck, Glittermonger should be quite serviceable. So we'll give it a C. High Rise Sawjack, 3 mana 2 3 elf citizen at common with reach, and if it blocks a creature with flying, it gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. 
So you can take out four toughness flyers even. So yeah, if you're in the market for a reach creature or maybe a citizen in your citizen uh, synergy decks, this will do. Nothing fancy, but certainly playable. Gets a C. Jewel Thief, a 3 mana, 3-3 three, three, Cat Rogue at common, has Vigilance and Trample. And if that weren't enough, when it enters, it creates a treasure token. Well, this certainly has a lot of text, and uh, seems just a, an incredibly efficient card. And uh, seems difficult not to give it a B, just because of how much it does. Fix your mana, ramp, Vigilance, Trample, all relevant keywords. Probably the best green common in the set. Luxurious Libation is an instant speed uncommon pump spell for X and a green, giving a creature plus X plus X until end of turn, and creating a 1 1 green and white citizen creature token. So it could be a great finisher in your aggressive green decks, especially Cabaretti, if you're going wide with a bunch of tokens. One of them is bound to go unblocked and then you can sink all your mana into pumping it, but also pretty nice on defense. Opponent attacks, you pump your creature before blocks, and then you get a 1-1 token in addition, which can also maybe block or chump if needed. So we get a lot of flexibility, but only really shines if we can spend a lot of mana casting it, because if x equals 0, I guess we can still make a 1-1 token, but, you know, that's not particularly exciting. So... I think the flexibility overall might uh, bump this up to a C+. Next we have Most Wanted, to in a green for an enchantment aura at common, has flash, enchanting a creature giving it plus two, plus one, and when the enchanted creature dies, create two treasure tokens. Doesn't draw a card, plus two, plus one is not that much. So it's not like we're going to ambush something all that easily, thanks to Flash. And then two treasure tokens are nice, but we're probably losing a couple of cards in the process. So not that into this. Give it a D. Prize Fight, two mana instant speed fight spell. That also makes a treasure token at common. So instant speed is nice, but it's fight and not bite. So need to make sure our creature is large enough to actually win the fight. And then the treasure token could also come in handy. So it's a fine removal spell, um, but at the end of the day, still a fight spell, which comes with its own potential risks and concerns. So we'll give it a C. A Rocks Pummeler, 6 mana, 6-3, six, Rhino Soldier at common, enters with a shield counter on it, and has Trample as long as it has a shield counter on it. So yeah, this seems pretty reasonable. Um, if we play it, the opponent has a large attacker, we can block with it and trade away our shield counter. Still have a 6-3 left over. And if we're on offense, can get a nice attack in. Opponent's probably forced to trade away a smaller creature to just soak up the shield counter, still take some trample damage. And then we still have a 6-3 left over. So, while expensive, I think it will make for a fine curve topper in a lot of different green decks especially if we can somehow double its power, which we've seen in uh, the Riveteers deck. So we'll give it a C. Riveteers Decoy, 2 mana, 3 1 Human Warrior at Uncommon. Must be blocked if able. And also has Blitz, which is kind of pricey at 4 mana, but it's understandable why, because this could essentially take out an opposing creature and draw a card in the process. Now this doesn't say every creature able to block it must do so. So as long as the opponent has one creature to block it, they're fine. But uh, yeah, can still set up some interesting attacks, which the opponent may not be expecting. And uh, yeah, we still have the flexibility of just casting it for two mana. And then we can attack when we deem it necessary. So C plus for decoy. Social Climber, 3 mana, 3-2 three, Human Druid at common, and it's sort of the counterpart of the Roast Master in red. Instead of dealing damage, we gain one life. Now gaining life, not quite as exciting as dealing damage, even though they may seem quite similar. So I don't think it quite gets to the C+, 
but still a solid 3-drop for the Cabaretti tokens deck. So we'll give it a C. Take to the streets, a 5-mana kind of overrun effect, if you will. An uncommon sorcery, giving creatures plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. And citizens get an additional plus 1, plus 1, and vigilance until end of turn. So a great finisher for the Cabaretti tokens deck, especially if you have tons of citizens. Doesn't give trample, only plus 2, plus 2 to non-citizens. So you do have to be pretty committed to the citizen theme for it to be worth it, I think. But uh, yeah, assuming you can go wide enough, this could be a great way to end the game or force the opponent to make some ugly blocks. So not a card that uh, a lot of decks are going to be interested in, so you shouldn't be prioritizing it too much. So probably not more than a C. Titan of Industry, 7 mana, 7-7 seven, seven Mythic Rare Elemental, has Reach and Trample. And when it enters, we can choose two modes between destroying an artifact or enchantment, uh, destroying an artifact or enchantment. Target player gains 5 life, create a 4-4 green Rhino Warrior creature token, or put a shield counter on a creature you control, including potentially the Titan itself. So I think the default modes will be 7-7 seven, seven with shield counter on it and make a 4-4 token, and then where necessary can take out artifacts or enchantments or gain some life. So yeah, seems like a very powerful curve topper. Of course, kind of expensive at 7 mana, but should help you stabilize nicely thanks to reach. And then uh, trample means it's going to be difficult for the opponent to chum block their way out of it. Now there are a couple, you know, relatively clean answers in the format. Cards that can maybe exile it. Although then we might still have a 4-4 Rhino left over. All right, sure, we'll give it an S. Why not? Then we have Topiary Stomper, 3 mana, 4-4 four, four plant dinosaur at rare, has Vigilance, and when the Stomper enters the battlefield, can search her library for a basic land to put on the battlefield tapped, and the Stomper cannot attack or block unless we control 7 or more lands. So it doesn't play all that well with treasure tokens, which are a form of ramping which doesn't put additional lands in play, but it does potentially play well with Casualty, as a 4-powered creature we can potentially sacrifice without feeling bad about it. And uh, if the, the game naturally progresses, eventually gives you a nice 4-4 Vigilance creature, can crew vehicles as well. So definitely an interesting uh, card with a lot of neat applications that might not be immediately obvious. So overall, I think makes it a C+, has enough uh, going for it. Venom Connoisseur is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two human druid at Uncommon, with Alliance giving it Death Touch until end of turn, and if it's the second time this ability has resolved this turn, all creatures we control gain Death Touch until end of turn. So it seems very nice if you can give a whole army of 1-1 tokens Death Touch, because now the opponent's not willing to necessarily block and uh, trade, so you can sneak in quite a bit of damage. So that's where the Connoisseur is going to be at its best. Also, if you can make two tokens at instant speed, once again, giving your team death touch at instant speed as kind of a surprise, can completely decimate the opponent's board. So certainly be weary of uh, any instant speed token makers when there's a connoisseur on the board. But uh, yeah, overall, C plus at the very least. Voice of the Vermin, 4 mana, 2-2, two, two, human citizen at uncommon. When it enters, it enters with a shield counter on it. And when it attacks, target creature you control has base power and toughness 4-4 four, four until end of turn. Also citizen, which is noteworthy. And uh, yeah, it's another one of these creatures that comes with a shield counter, but isn't incredibly large. So if this is attacking, it gets kind of one free attack, opponent probably able to remove the shield counter from it, and then it's no longer uh, a very good card. So kind of tough to evaluate, I might be slightly off on some of these shield counter creatures, but uh, I'm gonna stick to a pretty low C for Voice of the Vermin. Warm Welcome, 3 mana instant at common, letting us look at the top 5 cards of our library to reveal a creature and put it into our hand. 
and we get to make a 1-1 citizen token in the process. So uh, this is an instant, so potentially a way to trigger our alliance cards at instant speed. And uh, yeah, hopefully we've got enough creatures where we can find something and make a token in the process. So while a little bit pricey at 3 mana, it's providing additional advantage bit by bit. So it seems okay but uh, also not particularly exciting, so just a playable C grade card. Workshop Warchief is a 5 mana, 5-3 five, Rhino Warrior at rare. It tramples and when it enters it gains 3 life, and when it dies create a 4-4 four, four green Rhino Warrior creature token. And of course we can blitz it, although it's kind of expensive at 6 mana. Although then we get a nice attack in, draw card, and have a leftover warrior token in addition to gaining some life. So definitely has some Thraktusk vibes, which is uh, certainly a compliment. And uh, we've got the flexibility of Blitz potentially giving it haste. So there's a lot to like about the Warchief. Certainly a bomb level card, at the very least an A. First artifact is Arc Spitter, one mana artifact equipment at uncommon. And Equips for just one mana, saying the equipped creature can pay one mana to deal one damage to target creature that's blocking it. So not the most straightforward card, but it's basically a way for you to discourage opposing creatures from blocking, assuming you have enough mana to sink into this and are willing to do so. Um, yeah, it's not really adding any power or toughness. Could be okay in the late game, I suppose but then the opponent's just going to ignore it, so it's like, I guess it's essentially making your creature unblockable until the opponent is forced to chump. Not that exciting. I guess it is a combo with Death Touch, because it's the creature dealing damage and not the equipment, but there's not that many Death Touch creatures in the set, so... Yeah, we can use the ability multiple times, that's kind of the idea behind it. But uh, yeah, still not really sold on Arc Spitter. I'll give it a D. Next up... We have Brass Knuckles. Now this is a fun one. A 4 mana uncommon equipment. When we cast it, we get to make a copy of it. And equips for 1 mana. And then the equipped creature has double strike as long as 2 or more equipment are attached to it. Let's say we play the Brass Knuckles. It's gonna cost 2 more mana to equip both copies to one creature, so it's 6 mana total to give our first creature double strike. But then the next time it's only 2 mana. And it also plays well with author equipment if we happen to have a bunch of them, although that seems pretty rare, where you can have an equipped creature, put the knuckles on it to give a double strike, and I guess with enough equipment you can give two creatures double strike. Don't think that's going to happen very often. But um, yeah, I think this card actually has a little bit of potential, especially in maybe like a Blitz deck with the Riveteers, where... You know, you have to pay a pretty steep price up front to play it, but then it's only 2 mana for double strike, and if you can give maybe like a 5 powered creature double strike, if it already has maybe some built-in trample, you could be staring at a lot of damage. Let's go with a C plus for Brass Knuckles. Cement Shoes, 1 mana uncommon equipment, equips for 2 mana, giving the equipped creature plus 3 plus 3, but a significant drawback, at the beginning of your end step, tap this creature. And the equipped creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. Okay, so it takes a second to wrap your head around it, so it's not a card we can use defensively, because if we're trying to block with the equipped creature, it's just going to end up being tapped. So the idea is we play this, equip a creature, attack with it right away, and then maybe move it to a creature we don't care about, so we can then move it back and keep attacking. But some of our creatures are going to end up staying tapped in the process, unless they maybe trade it off. So it's kind of a complicated card to play with, and uh, therefore I'm not sure on this evaluation. But um, yeah, it's kind of clunky, need to jump through a few hoops. Although, that being said, 3 extra power and toughness for only a an equip cost of 2 is a very good rate. Yeah, I think the deck where you want this is probably the Cabaretti tokens deck, where you can 
equip some small creatures and keep moving it around. So overall, um, probably give it a C. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. Might end up uh, slightly higher. Definitely one of the more unusual cards in the set. Chrome Cat, a 3-mana three 3-2 three artifact creature cat at common. When it enters, scry 1. Eh, nothing exciting. If you need a filler creature, this will do, but uh, not a card you actively want to play. Gets a D. Getaway Car, 3-mana rare artifact vehicle. Has haste, it's a 4-3, crew cost is only 1, and when the car attacks or blocks, we can return up to one target creature that crewed it this turn to its owner's hand. Okay, so if maybe the opponent enchanted one of our creatures with a, a negative aura, we can still maybe crew our creature and then pick it back up. So that's nice. We don't have to pick up a creature. The car has haste, so if we play a 2-drop car on 3, smash for 4, that's a pretty nice sequence. And... Uh, can maybe re-enable enter the battlefield abilities, but I'm also not wild about uh, vehicles necessarily, so I'll give it a C plus. Then we've got the Gilded Pinions, a two mana equipment at common, two mana to equip, giving the equipped creature flying, always uh, noteworthy, and when it enters the battlefield we create a treasure token as well, so quite flavorful. Yeah, the pinions as a flying equipment could help you cross the finish line. I imagine this will be at its best in like a Riveteers deck where you can maybe deal some early damage, but you might struggle to close out the game. And then late game equipping some of your large rhinos could uh, get there for you. Um, so yeah, good with large creatures as opposed to tokens where you want equipment that can increase power and toughness instead. But uh, yeah, overall, Pinions gets a C. Not a card you want a ton of copies of in your deck, so decks that want it should be able to get one. Halo Scarab, a 2-mana, two 2-1 two artifact creature insect at common. Can pay 2-mana, exile it from your graveyard to create a treasure token. Yeah, not that exciting. Maybe in a deck that has a lot of self-mill, you can get a bit of value from it, but even so, kind of expensive for not a whole lot of benefits, so... D for Halo Scarab. A Luxior, a Janus, Gift, one mana, legendary equipment at Mythic. And this is a weird one. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one for each counter on it. And the equipped permanent isn't a planeswalker and is a creature in addition to its other types instead. Equips planeswalkers for one mana, equips creatures for three mana. So this doesn't do anything unless it's either equipping a Planeswalker, which is very unlikely, or is equipping a creature that has counters on it. And while there are a couple shield counters and plus one counters, there's not enough for me to want to include this in any deck, pretty much. So that gets an F. Ominous Parcel, a one mana artifact at common, can pay two mana, sack it to search our library for a basic land card and put it into our hand. It's an excellent way of fixing our mana. And then we can also pay 5 mana, tap and sacrifice to deal 4 damage to target creature instead. So this is perfect, early on can fix your mana, and in the late game we can use it as removal instead. So especially in uh, like 4 or 5 color decks this will be an important part of your mana base. But even in a 3 color deck I'm happy to have this. So C+. Paragon of Modernity. 4 mana, 2-2, two, two, artifact, creature, angel, warrior. Angel can be a relevant creature type. At common, it flies, and for 3 mana, we can give it plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. But if exactly 3 colors of mana were spent to activate it, we can put a plus 1 counter on it instead. A significant upgrade. So a little bit slow to get going, but assuming we have 3 different colors, we'll uh, quickly grow over time. Still kind of slow and a lot of mana before it becomes a significant threat. So still more of a filler card, but you could definitely do worse. So we'll give it a C. Quick Draw Dagger, a 3 mana equipment at common, has flash, and when it enters we can attach it to a creature right away and give it first strike until end of turn, giving it plus one plus one 
and then equips for one mana afterwards. So kind of a neat combo trick that then later still functions as an equipment, although it's kind of limited to just plus one plus one. So if the opponent's playing around smaller combo tricks, they're also playing around quick draw dagger. So still kind of limited in its uh, use cases, but I do like it in theory. Still probably not more than a C. Then we've got Scuttling Butler, 3 mana, 4 1 artifact creature construct and uncommon, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control 2 or more multicolored permanents, the butler gains double strike until end of turn. So it can hit incredibly hard, of course takes a bit of work to get going, but uh, yeah, as a 3 drop can fit into any deck, and there's going to be a lot of multicolor decks floating around. So a C plus for Butler. Suspicious Bookcase reprinted, 2 mana, 04 artifact, creature wall, and uncommon with Defender, and can pay 3 mana, tap it to make a creature unblockable until end of turn. So can be a nice early defensive option, and then later helps you close out the game. So fine card, gets a C. Unlicensed Hearse, 2 mana, Vehicle, at rare, can tap to exile up to 2 target cards from a single graveyard, and has power and toughness, each equal to the number of cards exiled with it, crew costs only 2. So it doesn't do anything until you exile a couple cards with it. There's not a huge graveyard theme in the set outside of those blue-black cards, uh, which you can certainly uh, punish with a hearse. In most games of Limited, cards do naturally end up in graveyards, so the hearse can pretty steadily grow over time. Gonna take a while to get going, but uh, yeah, if the game is grindy uh, enough and goes long enough, I could see this being a significant threat, and especially against the black uh, decks that have a bit of graveyard recursion, you can shut it down by exiling their creatures, so yeah, it has a couple applications, but... Uh, probably not more than a C. And then we get to our lands, and uh, I'm not going to go a very individual land since there are a couple cycles of lands. Taking a look at Broker's Hideouts, it's a cycle of lands that when they enter the battlefield we have to sacrifice them, and if we do we get to search our library for a basic of their respective uh, family colors, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and we get to gain one life. So in the case of the Broker's Hideouts, we can either get a forest, plains, or island representing the Brokers, and we've got one of these for each family. So these are all quite useful, important mana fixing. Take them early if you're planning to go uh, four or more colors. Get as many of these as you can get your hands on, pretty much, and uh, get a C plus at the very least. Then we've got the cycle of rare Trialands, Rafine's Tower as an example, Plains Island Swamp as land types, relevant in older formats, can be cycled for 3 mana if we don't need it, so we can discard it and draw a card, and then enters the battlefield tapped, but produces all 3 colors, so another great way of mana fixing, and probably better than the previous cycle, so it gets a B. And then we've got a cycle of dual lands, enter battlefield tapped, make uh, 2 colors, and for 4 mana we can tap and sacrifice them to draw a card, so in the late game they're still quite useful. So yeah, once again a great cycle of dual lands that gets a C+. So yeah, all these lands are going to be vital for building 3 color mana bases, especially 4 color mana bases if you're trying to do the double splash like I explained at the start of the breakdown here. So that concludes our set review. As a reminder once again, if you want access to my spreadsheet, which contains kind of the condensed version of this set review with ratings that I will keep up to date over time as I play the set more, make sure to join either the Patreon or become a Twitch subscriber. That way you'll have access to them. Going pretty far back to the earliest sets uh, available on Arena, like the early Ravnica expansions and Dominaria, so there's a ton of these uh, written set reviews in spreadsheet form you can consult, and uh, of course plenty of other perks when joining the Patreon as well, so I highly recommend it. 
And uh, yeah, other than uh, that, I want to thank everyone for watching. Let me know in the comments if uh, there's any ratings you agree or disagree with, any cards you're particularly looking forward to build around, but uh, excited to see how Streets of New Capenna will play out in Limited. So I want to thank everyone for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.